And we're live. Uh -huh. What was yes. it that uh, what was that Stephen Wright said? He's like, he said, he goes, why did why are the letter why is the alphabet in that order? Is it because that guy wrote that song? That's hilarious. He goes, that guy wrote everything. <laughs> because he wrote the, the alphabet. The guy who wrote the ABC song, you mean? What did you say? The guy who wrote the ABC song, you mean? Yeah. That's he's like, it's cause of, is it because of that song that guy wrote? And then he's like, <laughs> that guy wrote everything. Because <laughs> everything hilarious. was written with the alphabet. Right? Oh, God, that's hilarious. That's very funny. He's like, I like to tease my plants <clears throat> when I water them. I... Oh. I, I don't water them. I put ice cubes. <laughs> Hilarious, man. I've seen actually people do that. I've yeah. seen people do that. He's like, he's like I lost a buttonhole. <sighs> Listen, I just went to a restaurant in, this, in Manhattan. And uh, whatever, you know. And uh, I, I paid $76 for a brisket sandwich, uh, a, a sweet potato fries, and a, and a cup of tea. $76? Yes. Serves you right. That's right. It was, it was more for the company. Like, it was a reunion of my friends and I. Uh, you know, we all live in the different part. You know, two of us live in this area, and the other two live. Uh, one lives in in Israel, and the other one lives in a different part of the country. So, yeah, Ruch Hashem. But uh, yeah, you know, let's say I was the only one who was not uh, whatever out of the four of us. You know. What do you think? Terror inducing. <laughs> are you being serious or are you being? Uh... No, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not actually serious, but I should be. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm so, yeah. I'm so like numb. <laughs> so yeah, I, like... I, I, I hear you. Yeah. Um, what do you think of this thing with the tennis player, man? I think it's going to make some waves around the world. Where, where, I mean, yeah, I guess it's helpful when the best, like, mm -hmm. you know, tennis player, you know, ever. Statement. He's the best ever. ever. Really, he's really that good. He's better than Sampras. He's going, he's going to, he's, he, he's going, he already surpassed Sampras. He already surpassed Angus. He's going to surpass. Uh, uh, he's going to. What, what does it mean? No matter to, where. He's going I don't to do even know what that means to surpass. How do you surpass? He's going to win more Grand Slam tournaments than the other oh. two. Okay. He has, I think, the same amount of Grand Slam tournaments uh, at this point. Hold on. Most Grand Slams. Uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Uh, most Grand Slams would be Roger so far, Federer. Who has to, actually, they all have 20. Novak, I see, they don't, want him, they don't want him to pass the other two. Nadal has 20 and Novak has 20. Sampras has 14. And yeah, but is have, he meaner than McEnroe? That's what I want to know. Is he what? Is he is he meaner than McEnroe? He no one. He, he they, Djokovic. They call him the Joker because he's just a prankster. But Mac, yeah, there's nobody. Ain't nobody meaner than McEnroe. And McEnroe only won seven Grand Slams. That is. But uh, yeah, ain't nobody meaner than McEnroe. But I was watching this Nadal guy. You know, I want to. I want to show people. Hold on. How do I do screen share here? Oh, here we go. I want to show people. I want to show you as well. I saw it. I saw you it. saw this thing, right? You saw this guy. Yeah, I saw the shoulders going up and down. So what I, a what a twerp! What a little twerp! What is know, that? that that's, that's fear. What is that? That's just yeah, like I, I think so. I think I think they. He looks like somebody who's been threatened. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like saying, yeah. like you know, we're gonna, you know, we. are we're gonna do something to, to your loved ones or something like yeah. that. Yeah, if you, if you, yeah, because I I said that, you know the the guy's uncle who was his coach, he his uncle was was a very famous soccer player in Spain. And I know that Rafa sees these guys plotting every day on the field. Rafa Rafa 
Is this like if he wasn't going to play tennis, he would have played professional soccer. That's what that, that's his name, Rafa. Rafael, Rafael. They call him Rafa. They call him Rafa. He's from Mallorca, uh, Spain. Mallorca. Like, Mallorca. Yes. You know that song? It's Mallorca, Mallorca. I, don't, I, actually, I actually don't know that song. Dude, it's like back in the day. Here, here you go. So Sounds here. gay. It's very, here, 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 here. here, here. So, here, Mallorca song. Here. Loft. The, the group is called Loft. Of course. What was trendy? What? Trendy. It was from 1996. Here, here, oh, here. Definitely not. Like one of these things. Yeah? This video is horrible. I wouldn't. I wouldn't play this. Video. Oh, you, oh, Euro dance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This kind of stuff. Yeah. Let's see. No. You know what I'm saying? This kind of stuff. I, I, I don't know it. I don't know it. <laughs> don't know it. Still don't know it. If somebody asks me that, I'll say no. Nope. This song used to be played, you know, like there were the, I used, whatever, I, in high school, I used to go to this club in um, near Newark in a place called Irvington, New Jersey. And there was a, a, a like a Polish predominantly polish nightclub but it was like also russians used to go there oh, yeah yeah you told me this was the Euro cricket club. cricket and they used to play euro this kind of stuff hilarious just hilarious think about it you know i was i was horrified when you know when i came back from uh from israel uh-huh you told me <laughs> right so no but i i never told you like i was horrified by american pie and by the spice girls okay oh and the spice girls are literally like bach compared to what's going on yeah. now. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, freaking uh, <laughs> Japan, you know? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Compared to what's going on now. But um, no, but but what, what else was horrifying to me was like this kind of like <laughs> horrible, cheesy Euro dance yeah. popularity. Well, that stuff was going on since not like the early 90s. 90s. No, but it wasn't, it wasn't big. It wasn't big. It was coming. It was coming, and we used to get like you know these cassettes from like Poland and stuff. Our friend used to bring him to school. He's like, "You want to hear Dream Dance? Dream Dance, ninety five. Dream Dance, ninety six. Dream Dance, ninety seven. Disco, 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 disco. Partisan, yeah. Dream Dance ten. They came out the new dream. It was a, it was a cover with the dolphins. You know that. Uh, yeah, Dolphin's dolphin. Mind, wasn't it, or something like that? Was it dolphin, dolphin, yeah, no, I'm saying that the, the cover of the CD was Dolphin. It was, it was, a, it was a Dolphin related. Uh, one, two, three, ten, whatever. Something, dolphin, yeah. They, they involved. Then they had Gate Crasher. Remember Gate? Do you remember Gate Crasher? I remember, I know this term, Gate Crasher. It was Gate Crasher Red, Gate Crasher Blue, Gate Crasher Wet. Gate Crasher, they had, whatever. It's like a compilation of different populist, you know. So that wasn't an artist. That was just like a name of a company. Yeah, it was. A, it was a label, and it was just they did like you know also uh, stuff, uh, more like Oakenfold kind of stuff, you know, sounding. Yeah. It's very good. It's from UK, also like Ministry of Sound and you know, all these kind of things. Um, yeah, I only really discovered Progressive House when I came back. Friggin'. Yeah. Uh, Greg and you know those guys they 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 introduced me to it. I didn't know anything about that. Yeah, I hear that. I mean, I knew the house, you know what I mean? I yeah. just didn't know you didn't understand you, you didn't understand what it was what it was to stand next to the speaker. Yeah, the the gang the gang, the gang wars that were going on between uh, between <laughs> uh, what was the guys uh, the trance heads and the progressive yeah. house guys. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then the there was the deep factory, house guys. Sound factory okay. versus yeah. vinyl. <laughs> yeah, it was like it was like the Victor Calderon's soldiers and versus like uh Danny Tanaglia soldiers. I don't know about that. I mean, those huh? are two. Those are like Victor Calderon's, like super gay. Like, like, <laughs> yes. Right. And and, yeah. and um, I don't mean like I don't mean like as I've never seen him as a person. I don't know if he yeah. talks, if he talks with a lisp or anything. No, the 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 crowd. Yeah. The crowd, dude. It was like <laughs> it was like I, I went to vinyl one night and it was like <laughs> seriously. It was like it was like I, I discovered I'm in the Blue Oyster Bar. What about the Junior Vasquez parties, dude? Forget about that. I never, I never, I never, went I to never been to one by design. I never went. No, no, I, I actually, 
I meant to. I didn't know that they were that gay. You know what I mean? So, it's, it's the only party where you're going to see hot chicks who go there just to dance because they know they're not going to get hit on anybody, by anybody. Or so, Germans, hit on them. or so the Germans would have you believe. Yes. <laughs> I, was wait, I was waiting to fit that in somewhere. I was like, it seemed like the right time. <laughs> just keep thinking of the blue oyster. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um so back to this nadal guy man like it's just it's such a it's just a disgrace i used to like him who nadal rafael nadal, nadal. i used to like i used to like him he's it's such a this like a sniveling little ugh. don't you know like don't hate don't hate because they probably like they probably yeah. threaten. that's what he looked like he looks like he got roused he looks like he got oh, the, like, yeah he yeah. got roughed up. That's what it looks like. It looks like a guy who yeah. literally just got roughed up. That's I. Yeah. That's I've seen or, that. Before. Or just got a phone call. Like you mean like verbally roughed up, not to the actual somebody like. Or physically. like, or like somebody came to him, you know, like and poked him yeah. in the chest, you know, like some tough yeah. guy with like yeah. a with a toothpick in his mouth, right? Yeah. Yeah. And he's like he's looking at him. He goes, "Look at my ass. Look yeah. at him. You understand? Yeah. You understand?" Yeah. He's like, yeah. "Yes, si, sí, señor, si." Sí, sí. yeah. Fi, fi, senor. He's, like, he's got that uh, Spanish. Yeah. From Spain. Si, I mean, uh, España. Uh, Ibiza. Ibiza. Si, senor. Yeah, he's like, he's like, he's like, what do you say? He's like, you know, I, I, I do the stuff. And, uh, he's like, people who know much better than me, I they take a decision. People know much better than us. The solution, a lot of people had a lockdown in this country. And the he's, people like, listen, the he's like, listen, puto. Listen, puto. to Marbella. I'm a and have a drink and yeah. shut the, and shut the fog up. But, uh, yes, let me tell you. I mean, I'm gonna put you in cement. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like I'm gonna take your bells and I'm gonna put them in a sling and I'm gonna I'm gonna crush them. <laughs> what is that from? That's from Johnny Dangerous. That, that, yeah, no, that that's Maroni. He's like, <laughs> I'm gonna take your bells. I'm gonna put them in a sling. I'm gonna crush them. He's like, <laughs> my mo- my mother hung me on a hook once. 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 Don't hang me on a hook. Uh, so yeah, so this Novak thing, man, I think it's going to go further than te- it's it's further than tennis. You understand? Like the guy, it's funny because I remember the guy like five years ago took some time off to go on some like a spiritual journey, and um, people always criticize. You know, he he's got like also did alternative medicine. That's how he figured out that he has a gluten problem. Um, he was into all that kind of stuff, you know, and people were like mocking him and whatever. I'm doing a, I'm doing a lectin. A le- I'm trying to do a lectin free thing. Which is what? So gluten is part of a wider category of proteins, which are called lectins. And lectins are basically mm-hmm. plant poison. Meaning plants, apparently they evolved to poison the animals that threaten their, their existence. Mm-hmm. Okay. Other plants, they didn't produce that because they need the animals to eat them because those animals spread their seeds, like mm-hmm. in their fur or in their in their waste. But lectins were these basically plant poison, and a lot of the foods that people are eating now, gluten is one of them. A lot of the the foods that people are eating now, uh, people in the past did not eat. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's what that's what the guy told me. He's like, we haven't really evolved. Our digestive systems have not evolved to be able to um, digest what we're eating today, like yeah. the breads and all this kind of stuff. The breads, even tomato sauce. Yeah. For instance, people think that you know that ancient Romans were having tomato sauce. Tomato sauce was brought from the from America. Tomato. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They didn't use tomato sauce, and but but what they do, the Italians, they're, they're smartest. As to, as to their attitude about the tomato sauce, because they, first of all, n- nobody ever buys tomato sauce in Italy. Yeah, yeah sure. one. Number they two, it. they peel, they they get rid of the peels, and they get rid of the seeds in the tomato because that's where all the lectins are. So the sauces that they make are relatively l- much lower in lectins than than what you know people have. Like you know, you you slice up a salad, right? And you're getting a ton of lectins and it messes up your gut. It creates like they call it leaky gut or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so gluten is just one of the things that does that. So 
but it's uh, lectin the lectin free diet is like yeah you're gonna you're gonna be cooking diet and you're not gonna be going to restaurants diet yeah I hear that. No, the, 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 to be honest with you, man, based on what I told you today, what I spent on a brisket and some fries and, and a tea, I'm not going to be going to any restaurants anytime soon. You know, because I don't believe in eating, you know, uh, something that was once alive. Uh, I, I don't feel bad for you. I don't feel bad for myself just because, you know, Whatever. Pay, pay, mother effort, pay. Suffer. Uh, in any Suffer. event. Yeah. So 38, huh? You ever see, um, yeah. You ever see, there's this uh, actor, his name is uh, Paige Kennedy, this black dude. He's kind of like, he wasn't very famous. He was on a couple of shows. I need to see the face. He was on a couple of shows. He's not well known, but he was like, he kind of was big on Snapchat. He did this like uh, videos. Uh, he looks you know who he looks like warren sap this football player looks like a he looks like a black charlie chaplin is what he looks like he tries to make his black face charlie like his, chaplin i don't yeah, know yeah he does he does he actually does charlie chaplin's face interesting like you know like comically like he's kind of like a sometimes he's fat sometimes he's jacked very strange he, he does he does like he, he did like these funny videos that are kind of popular and every time like he would play like these pranks where like the camera would be zoomed in on like, you know, a butt and you would think like that it was like a, a lady's butt. And then the, the, the camera pans out and it's his butt. And he's like, he's like, uh, what is that twerking? He's twerking. And he's like, he's like, suffer perverts. <laughs> he's like, he's so weird. <laughs> That's so weird. Suffer perverts. I love that. It's very strange. That, that was, that made an impression on me. That was funny. Age Kennedy. He's like, a, he looks like he's like a butt. Lifts weights a lot. Yeah, no, he's kind of, he's kind of, he's kind of jacked. Yeah, he was on that show. I don't know. You may have not even seen it. Remember mm. Dwight from The Office? Uh, I'm looking at the shows that he was on. He was in movies. This is his filmography. Uh, he was just like in B, B movies. The biggest role that he had was on a show that was on for one or two seasons. That was actually a pretty big show. Uh -huh. it, it was with Dwight. From the office okay uh he had um he was like kind of like a sherlock holmes type of guy you know he, he saw crimes and stuff like that and csi was, I'm a, I'm a no 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 not csi it was um uh, uh i'm looking at is Dwight, Dwight from the office what is that guy's name and what was the show i'm trying to i'm going to find it right now dwight from the office uh, first i need to figure out what this guy's name is uh, okay, so I know who this guy is now. He, I know who this guy is now. White, oh, Rain Wilson. Okay, Rain Wilson is the actor's name. Oh, who, and, what was he in? Let's see, television. Okay, television. He was in. You just do Rain Wilson and Paige Kennedy. Backstrom, Backstrom. Backstrom? Yeah, Backstrom. There was an uh, officer Frank Model. Yeah, it was actually, actually one Backstrom centers Edward Backstrom, an overweight, offensive, irascible police officer who engaged in a constant struggle with self-destructive tendencies and is part of a team of eccentric criminologists. Yeah, it was actually, it wasn't a bad show. But I don't know. Former, what he played a former MMA fighter, Frank Motto, member of Special Crimes Unit, Paige Kennedy. Really weird. I remember one, in one of the episodes, it was like there was some kind of murder going on with firemen. And like, and the theme of the episode was like, you know, the fireman's calendar, like, you, you mm -hmm. know, like the, the, you know, the handsome fireman. And mm -hmm. so, and they were trying to get like rough. And, and then this guy comes in, he goes, he goes, hey man, I got the kind of muscle that, that ain't pretty. I got a kind of muscle that'll hurt you. That kind of, he said something like that, which is yeah. whatever. I don't know why we got on this. Oh, because of suffer perverts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I thought, I thought that was funny. Oh, <laughs> That's pretty random. Um, Stuff for perverts. So yeah, man, it's it's. Uh, what can I say? Um, okay, so thirty-eight, thirty-eight. It's a spiritual war that I'm seeing. You know, the YouTube. I'm, I told you what the what on YouTube that message that they left me when they put this information on one of the videos. 
and the message that they, the first thing they decide to write, I told you this, right? What's the first thing they decide to write? And the community guidelines, the first thing that's written. A policy means for you. Treatment, Shmish information, content that encourages the use of home remedies, prayer, or rituals in place of medical treatments, such as consulting a doctor or going to the hospital. That's the first thing they list that, of stuff that you can't say out of like 50 things that you can't say. It's amazing. The yeah, first yeah. thing, it's not the second thing, it's not the third thing, it's not in the middle, it's not do somewhere you know, down the list. Do you know when the Trump, like uh, the Trump, like uh, social media, truth, you know, like truth, uh, uh, that word, something like that is coming out. You, hold on. I was trying to get a date. I don't see. Any okay. Date. One second. Truth uh, social. Truth Not social. likely to launch for months. They're saying in February, supposedly, but I don't know. That would be, that would be, that's pretty, it's fairly Mike, soon. That, that and then it says Michael and Dell to compete against Trump's truth social with own social. See, they're all going to convince us good for it's competition. You got Getter, you got this. Yeah, I mean, we could, like, I think, I think they're going to dominate. Like, Rogan went over yeah, today, yeah. Tucker yeah. Carlson joined Getter. Yeah. You know, I yeah. These, these people are bringing, like, yeah. uh, they're planning on launching, they plan on launching February 21st. I think, dude, I think, uh, I think Rogan brought like 10 million. He bought a lot of people. Better, right? He brought a lot of people to the, what's it called? Yeah. He brought a lot of people over there. Why does, why does God like Rogan so much? Yeah. Why does God like Rogan? Yeah. God likes people who allow others to speak the truth, even if that person is a supposed, whatever, controlled schma position. He didn't, he doesn't do that all the time. Like, I, I know for a fact, you know. Um, well, Rogan figured out how to do it. You have to figure out how to do it. Also, Rogan, Rogan is not a Jew. If it was a Jew trying to do that, the Yetzirah would <laughs> stop him. Oh, your brother went on Charlie Kirk. Whoa. Oh, he's been on Charlie Kirk a number of times. I've never seen him on that show. Ever. I'm a little confused because it says that it was, it was, uh, look, it says like 2021. But it was posted today, so yeah, I think they screwed up because you know it's it's always, it happens. It's the new year, and they you know it's still better than the mistake that Biden made twenty twenty. Twenty twenty. Let's see. What did your brother say? Oh, this is like a whole, it's like a whole radio thing. Oh, he's it's a video. You breed variants. You exert evolutionary pressure. Okay. He was talking about. He was talking about. Um, the usual it's the virus that yeah. you know ebola like that it's in china right now oh the thing yeah what the heck is that man i hope it's not that, that marburg thing i don't know what is this are they just gonna release a uh, thing that kills like 40 percent of the people or 40 40 percent of people who get it i don't know That's man gotta... yeah see new ebola like virus found on the chinese bats liver again with his bats Oh, that, that was from 2019. Not the bat's fault. God. Bat crazy. didn't do a damn thing. What is this? Snouchy did it. This is ridiculous. Why are you whispering? I, said, I, I don't know, but it's ridiculous. <laughs> He's like, I, I just find things to be ridiculous. You were seething, right? You, get, you just get so mad that you start talking loud. I'm not me and mad. I'm just, I'm just like perplexed. This is my perplexed whispering. So I'll, I'll distract you with, uh, with 38s. You want to hear about 38s? Sure. Let's do it. Okay, so I think, I think we could start a, a, like, a, like a cool tradition, right? Like with every number, yeah. let, look in the Torah and see where's the first appearance of this number, either in a word or a phrase. Yeah. So the first appearance of 38 in the entire Torah uh, is in Bereshit, Chapter two, verse three, where it says, but, okay, so Vayvorech Elohim et Yom Hashri'i, right? Vayikadesh Oto, Ki Vo. And then it says Shabbat Mikol Malachta. So Ki Vo, those two words together, that's 38. So Ki Vo means because in it, because in it. And, it, and, we're, and we're referencing here uh, sanctifying the Shabbat. Yeah. Okay, so 38, uh, it seems to be 
immediately involved with the entire purpose of existence. That's pretty good. Yeah. Because in it, right? Mm -hmm. What are we referring to? The Shabbat, right? In, yeah. in, in, that, in the context that it, it's appearing in. Okay. The second appearance of 38 is the word libo, meaning his heart. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the first, it's actually in chapter six, verse five. We don't see another 38 for like four chapters. And uh, it says, Vayar, Vayar. Hashem, Ki Rava. There's no. I can't read without without vowels. I'm trying mm -hmm. to. Yeah. Vat Adam, the Eretz v'Chol Yatzar. You have to know the word. That's what. So. Yeah. Machshavet, Machshavet, Machshavet. Libo, rock, rock, ra, meaning like only evil thoughts in his mind, in the in the minds of man. This is like when God sees that. There's nothing but evil going on in the minds of man. Libo, in his heart. The word libo means heart, but it can also be um, the mind, the inner, the, the innerness of a person, you know, where their thoughts and their feelings occur. Okay. In their heart, libo. Okay. All right. So that's interesting. Okay. What's the connection? I don't know. There is one. I just don't know what it is just yet. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to just look a little further. Okay. So there's a bunch of Libos. Hold on. Libo, Libo, Libo. Okay. And then we have Beohel in the tent. Interesting. Okay. Vayomru Elav. This is, uh, chap this is chapter 18, verse 9. It says, Vayomru Elav, I, Sarah, uh, Ishtecho, this is the angel asking Abraham uh, when he's coming to bring news, right? This is right after Abraham uh, mm. did the Brit Milah and he was waiting by the door of the tent uh, to welcome guests and he saw, the, he saw the three men who were the angels. And mm. so it says, Vayomru Eilav, and he said to him, Ay Sara Ishtecho, uh, Vayomer, and he said, Hine Ohel in the tent. Oh, hell. Interesting. Okay. There's a lot of in it, by the way. There's a there's a pattern developing, because the first the first was key ball, right? Because in it, correct? Do you recall that? Yeah. Okay. That, that was when when God was sanctifying the Shabbat, because in it he rested, right? And then Libo is in his heart. Okay. In the heart, and then the ohel is in the tent. There's, clear, there's a clear connection between all these things. Okay. Uh, let's see. By by Yivach. So, to, chapter twenty-seven, verse thirty-eight in Bereshit, it says, "Vayomer Esav El Aviv Chabracha Achat Hu." Lech, uh, lech, uh, let's see, Lecha Avi Bercha, uh, Avi Berchani, that means like bless me, Gam also. Uh, Ani, uh, my father, or Ani Avi, what does that mean? My father, I am the father. That would seem, Ani Avi seems like it's I am the father, right? What is the, I'm going to look this up right now. Could be, it could be. I mean, this is Ace of talking to to Yaakov, obviously. Yeah. Oh no, no, actually, hold on. Um, I need Vayomer Ace of El Aviv to his father, a bracha achat who Avi Berhani Gam Ani. Well, whatever the word is, Vayavok. Vayavok. Let's see. Twenty-seven. See, I'm Hebraically challenged. Oh. It sucks. Okay. Hang on a second. Hang on. Hang on. We're going to, this is good. This is good. I don't think you're rhetorically challenged. I think you're, uh, was it I'm, phonetically maybe? Phonetically? I'm, I'm, I'm vowelly challenged. I'm yeah. the vowels. That's why yeah. I'm sure. Okay. So, uh, close that. Okay. By the way, do you want to know 18 things you might not know about the 18? 
18? 18 things, yeah. You might not know, right? That's amazing. It popped up on my 80s memory lane thing. Okay. Uh, I would like to know that. Okay. Very much so. Please. <laughs> Anything about the A team, I'd like to know. Okay. Those number, I heard again. number one. The cry. Wait, 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 wait. wait, wait hold, on, hold on. I want. I want to anticipate one of them. Okay. The guy who played. The guy who played Murdoch. What was <laughs> his name? Uh. That's the real Jim Carrey, whoever, whatever his name is. Oh boy, uh, Howling, uh, uh, Howling Mad Murdoch, which is uh, Schultz. Uh, uh, yeah, White Schultz, right? What do you mean? What do you mean? That's oh yeah, yeah, that's the original Jim Carrey. That, um, Jim Carrey stole this guy's life. <laughs> Just like to point that well, out. What does it say and here? He's a, and he's a conservative. I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, Okay, we'll, we'll talk about Murdoch in a second, but it, it, yeah, it doesn't mention anything about Jim Carrey's being whatever. Okay, so number it's one. Massive, it's a massive conspiracy. Jim of Carrey, course. he pays people to remove any reference to it. Of course. The internet. <laughs> number one, the crime they didn't commit was murder. In 1972, the A-team was sent on a covert mission to rob the Bank of Hanoi of gold bullion with the intent of helping to end the Vietnam War. They succeeded only to find that their commanding officer had been murdered in a traitor's double cross and his headquarters burned to the ground. Unable to prove that they were acting under orders, they were sent to maximum security stockade. Number two, there was only one sort of on-screen death in the entire run of the show. Fans remember almost every episode climax with explosions and gunfire and bad guys flying every which way, but no one ever actually got, uh, got hurt. Yeah. Crooks were thrown scrambling out of cars before they blew up or yeah. running away after being thrown out of a window. The only on-screen death was a death by explosion one implied of General Fulbright and the, the sound of thunder. Uh, yeah, no BA, one ever died, yeah. BA never actually says, I pity the fool. This was a catchphrase belonging to Mr. T, but it just, just like played against Sam and beat me up Scotty, the exact quote never appeared in the series. Usually BA preferred to call people suckers. Number four, the van has its own website. Well, not the van, but a replica of the highest standard built and painstakingly refurbished two brothers, Liam and Jerome Brett. They built it up from the original 1982 G-Series cargo van, which they imported from to, the U to the UK from Vermont and scoured the world for authentic parts. Their amazing work can be appreciated here. That's the link. Number five, the A-team is actually military terminology. Military actions such as forward attack are often done by assembled alpha team. The A-team advances first and then is often supported by a Bravo team or B-team. Alpha team can also refer to a special forces unit, which is more likely des the designation on the show. Number six, there's a Battlestar Galactica in-joke in the opening credits. Before Dirk Bennett became fifth man, he was Lieutenant Starbuck of the Colonial Service and the original Battlestar Galactica. The credit scene is lifted from an episode that partially takes place in the Universal Studios lot, where a Cylon, one of the, one Dude, of the Battlestar Galactica, that, that guy original, strolls past the perplexed-looking face man. The original Battlestar Galactica was actually pretty good. Like, mm. it obviously, it was like, you know, it was a little bit, nicer than, yeah. than the one that they released on you know on the i don't know if you've seen it did you see like the the one after the 2000s never i never was into the show so i don't know like what i don't know what's being spoken about it's a sci-fi show it's like sexual. no i know what the show is i'm saying i never i never watched it am i saying blasphemy now you are uh excused <laughs> 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 goodbye Goodbye, you know, AOL. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. Yeah. Number, okay, number seven. Murdoch's first name was never revealed. The members of the A-team included Lieutenant Colonel John Hannibal Smith, Lieutenant C Templeton Arthur Faceman Peck, Sergeant Bosco Albert Bad Attitude Baracus, and Captain H.M. Howland Mad Murdoch. Howland's first, uh, Murdoch's first name was never revealed. Interesting. And great, Dirk Benedict got the role of face because he was old. Another actor, Tim Dunnigan, was originally cast and shot the pilot episode of the show. However, on, on camera, Dunnigan admitted he looked like a high school sophomore, too young to play a Vietnam vet. He was replaced with Benedict. Hannibal, number nine, Hannibal is loosely based on a real-life colonel. Lieutenant Colonel Gordon Bo Gritz was a controversial Army Special Forces soldier who was popular because of the efforts he made to recover lost soldiers after the Vietnam War. His popularity coincided with the conception of the A-team, so Hannibal 
the leader of the ragtag band of crazy special forces heroes, was modeled after him. Number 10, it spawned a series of novels with titles like Bullets, Bikinis and Bells, and Operation Desert Sun, The Untold Story. The books are mostly novelizations of popular episodes. There were 10 published in all, although half were only printed in the UK. Most can be found on Amazon. 11, Mr. T thought, Mr. T thought the movie was, version was too smutty. The original BA had this to say about the 2010 big screen adaptation of the series, starring Liam Neeson and Bradley Cooper. People die in the film and there's plenty of sex. But when we did it, no one got hurt. It was all played for fun and family entertainment. This yeah. seems to be elements nobody is interested in anymore. It was too graphic for me. I have no doubt it will do big business at the box office, but it's nothing like the show we turn out every week. Ran on TV for five years without having to sex up the show. You can't get away with that these days. <laughs> 12, Mr. T quit. That, during was, a, that was great. That was, exa- that was so perfect, by the way. That, that's exactly <laughs> what he would sound like. I mean, he's a little bit older now. He's a little yeah. older than that. Yeah, no? yeah, yeah, yeah. Number 12, Mr. T quit during the fourth season and had himself flown off the set. While filming the fourth season premiere on a cruise ship, T had just suffered a loss in the family. Also, the air conditioner was annoying him. <laughs> he had himself helicoptered off the set and phoned the producer with a list of demands, at which point he was, quote unquote, fired. The two were able to work out the grievances and filming resumed. Number 13, Amy left because everyone ganged up on her. Melinda Kulea. We'll never know the particulars of why Melinda Kulea, who played the team's first feisty journalist sidekick, was written out in the second season. But consensus seems to be that there was a bad blood between her and Pepard from the beginning. Kalea claimed the animosity spread, and by the second season, the entire cast ganged up on her to get the producers to, producers to dump her. 14, the A-team was, was almost too violent for Germany. In 1989, oh. German broadcasters were interested in purchasing the rights to the A-team to run on German television. However, they found the show had, had a tendency to be excessively violent and chose only 26 of the 98 episodes to run. Number 15, girls were just there to look pretty. The producers of the show tried to attach female sidekicks to the team in the first two seasons to stem criticism of sexism, but it just didn't work. According to Marla Heasley, the, the second short-lived sidekick, Tanya, uh, Pepard took her aside to tell her no one wanted her there. Or as better put years later by Dirk Benedict, it was a guy's show. It was male-driven. It was written by guys. It was directed by guys. Yeah, they were trying to ruin everything. Yeah, yeah. It was acted by guys. It's about what guys do. We talk the way Why guys Why did talk. they have to come to the A-team? Why do women have to go to the NFL? Listen. The Just make your own A-team. Make because they want to be around men. We were the boss. We were the guys. No, they don't want to be around us. They just want to ruin stuff. I know. They want to rip our time. Yeah. Listen, listen. We smoked when we, when we wanted. We shot guns when we wanted. We kissed the girls and made them cry. And when we wanted, it was the last truly masculine show. Unbelievable. Uh, George Prepart smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. <laughs> Hand was always his best when he was chomping on cigar, but in real life, Prepart stuck mainly to cigarettes. He gave up smoking in 92 after the removal of a tumor from his lung. Unfortunately, it may have been too late, too little too late. Prepart died of pneumonia while still being treated for lung cancer in 94 at the age of 65. Number 17, yeah, Marvel Comics released in 18 young comic, man. Damn, comic book man. Yeah, no. comic book series. There were three comic books released separately at first, then repackaged together as the 18 storybook. And number 18, the series finale was buried in reruns. The Gray Team was intended to be the series finale, but for some reason it aired as a second to last episode. NBC forgot about, about without reservations episode and didn't air it until March of 87 amongst reruns. In reservations, Murdoch wears a shirt that reads almost Feeney in Gray Team. His shirt reads Fini, the French word for N. Interesting. That's all you get. A beautiful. That was that was probably the last really kind of just like guy show that was yeah. allowed that we were allowed to have. And it was no like for died. boys, and then boys like watched it and played with the, the yeah, band. by the way, by the way, no no one died. There was no sex, no women got raped, no one was touched inappropriately, and, and we can't have it. It was like Haredi. It's almost Haredi. Like Haredi men could watch that show and nothing would happen to them. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be, uh, you know. <laughs> it's like... No, seriously. You'd like, you could watch that show in 770. Nothing, not, you know, it's no problem. They, they had the best camera angles, you know, like when the when like the car would like fly into the air. And, like, yeah. and there was like the camera underneath it. You see the car flying up. They really did yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. 
There was engineering, there was teamwork. There what about was, MacGyver? Did you like MacGyver? Loved MacGyver. Loved that was MacGyver. awesome. I remember MacGyver well. By the way, the, the bad guy, his, his main nemesis in that show, guess what his name was? Hmm. Murdoch. Interesting. Yeah, but Murdoch was kind of like a, he's kind of like a, kind of like a fruity, kind of, huh. he's kind of like a fruity Mori, Moriarty, basically. That's what they, that's what they, that's the character that they made, like a that's kind of like funny. a fruity Moriarty. How, guess how old Richard Dean Anderson is today? I would say 70. There you go, 71 years old. Seven, damn, dude. That's crazy, man. He's like, uh, I don't need a gun. I just need a, a stick of chewing gum, uh, a cap from a pen, uh, a little bit of tobacco, and and a match, and uh, and we're good. Just 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 stand there while I assemble this together, and then I'll shoot you. Okay. He never yeah. carried a gun. His 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 character. He, yeah. I don't know if you know this, but his character never carried a gun. He always yeah. made it. Yeah, yeah. He, he was, it says preference for non-lethal resolutions to conflicts. Works for the fictional Phoenix Foundation in Los Angeles, which was, the, yeah, was, a, was an independent think tank. And then in the 2016 reboot is a clandestine government organization used to, using the cover of the think tank. Makes you wonder if there are any clandestine organizations using the covers of think tanks. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. Things that make you go, hmm. Yeah. Things that make you go, hmm. Of course, they, this guy that they got to play MacGyver in the in the reboot is some like modelly looking dude. I know, not, man. Not, it's not an actor; it's just a modelly looking dude who's like good enough for an actor, as opposed to a dude who's an actual actor. They got a I, blank face. They got a blank face. Yeah, they know? got a blank face. He's a blank face. He looks like he could be a KGB agent or something like that. A CIA slash KGB, whatever. That's a. He, look, he looks. Know, like, he looks a like a slightly. Guy. Slicing slightly more rugged version of a Disney, one of those Mickey Mouse Club guys. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, it's like it's just sad. He's kind of like you know, like uh MacGyver was kind of like a kind of like a tall, doofy, not doofy, yeah. but he had like, you know, he had a mullet, you know? He yeah, rock yeah. A mullet. He had like a doofy vibe, but he was like a decent looking guy, but he was like a doofy vibe. He wasn't yeah, he mullet. wasn't like, you know, he wasn't like uh trying to you know, seduce you with his uh, yeah. blue yeah. steel. He didn't have blue steel. <laughs> exactly. Like, if he got any woman, it was just a byproduct of, like, him being a mensch. Nothing to do with, like... There was this one episode... Being a freaking, like, whatever. Dude, there's this one episode where he was trying to solve a mystery where they found the skull, right? And then they took a cast of the skull, and then he wanted to recreate what the, what the person looked like. So they, they, they made a cast of the skull. And then from the cast, he, yeah. he saw him like he cut, the, he cut the erasers off of pencils and yeah. he started gluing them on the face like meticulously. And then he used like, you know, clay or whatever. And he, I was blown away with that when I was like seven. I'm like, what? Yeah. I didn't know you can do that. Mm -hmm. Put pencils on a person's face. And then figure out who they are. That's what I thought. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, the, the like you see these uh, what is it? The 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 pharaohs. They yeah, they're doing that now, but they I mean they're using like uh, they're using like uh, technology, you know, the computer. Like, yeah, like AI. Do that now. AI stuff and whatever. Dude, did you see those ones where like the Roman, all the Roman emperors, uh, here um, the statues, right? Yeah, but it's like not. It's it's like the faces. Hold on. They put the color and the faces. Yeah. To move a little bit. It's crazy. Yeah, Spanish artist recreates. Yeah. Famous Roman emperors through his realistic sculptures. Crazy man, you see like. Uh, yeah, uh, Julius Caesar. You know, like some of these guys, I look at their face, and you could you could just tell who's like a, like like a douche. Yeah. Like you look at it's like a you know, like a, a guy who's like a douche. Like you need these guys, you know. They look they, they all look a little bit odd, by the way. Ne Nero looked like a deformed weirdo. 
You looked a little. You looked a little. A little off. Nero look, look off. Nero looked off. Uh, who else do we have over here? No, there, there was a bunch of them. I, I can't. You know, Stephen Wright said, "He's no. like, like I want to open up. I want to open up a museum that has like the just the arms and the heads of all the other statues." Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like all the statues that are missing yeah, arms yeah. and heads. Funny. She wants the arms and the heads from those statues. That, that's funny. Hold, hold on a second. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. I'm just looking at uh, that 18. You read all 18 things about yeah, yeah, yeah. The, about the 18. Yeah. Well, I got something. Okay. This this is uh, verse 18. Nope, I'm sorry, I lied. It's verse 39. I thought it was verse 18, but it's not. It's 39. Okay. Hmm. There is a word. In verse 39 of chapter 27 of Genesis, mm -hmm. right? And that word has a gematria of 38. And I will find it in just a moment. Oh, yeah, it's the last word of the Pusik. Uh, it, it means vaye, vayevcha, something like that. It means, and he wept. Mm -hmm. And he wept. It was ace of crying when uh, he didn't have, he didn't get a bracha. Okay. Right. So. Hmm. Right? Hmm. 38s, 38s. Come on, man. Help me out with the 38s. I'm trying, I'm just looking at some of the, I'm trying to find like a half one intelligent, non douche, non douchey uh, Roman emperor. Trajan looked like a total psycho. Uh, yeah. Claudius Gothicus. Who is this guy? He looked like kind of a, he looked like he can work as like a quant on Wall Street. Interesting. He fought successfully against the Alemanni, the Germans, I guess. Yeah. Beat the Goths. He died after coming to a pestilence, possibly the plague of Supran that had ravaged the provinces of the empire. Interesting. Claudius Gothicus. Uh, military career. Rise Claudius to power. Gothicus? Yeah. Interesting. He was so goth. Like, he was really goth. No, they, I, I, think, I think they called him Gothicus because he conquered... Yeah. And goths. Then, uh, the gods, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by the way, the gods <laughs> are uh, it's it, there seems to be some significant evidence that the gods are actually, or at least a good portion of them, or are Israelites from the tribes. Uh, namely, of Israelites, I, I gotta show you the picture of Marcus Aurelius, man. Okay, but, but namely, on. namely. Uh, the tribe of God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I mean, yeah. that's where the name came from. By the way, you know, like they say the tribe of Gad, right? Yeah. That's mm -hmm. not the way it's pronounced. It's pronounced God. Yeah. With a TH. Yeah. Because the Dalid without a Dagesh is a TH. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I just sent you Marcus Aurelius. Antoninus, huh? I don't, yeah, I'm, we're assuming it's Where'd, in. Where'd you guy. send it? On Facebook? On Facebook, yeah. Uh, it could be, hold on. There's also Antoninus Pius, uh, but I think I, I suspect that it's this it's this here. Yeah, the guy uh, with the beard, of course. Yeah, that was more of a Greek thing than a Roman thing. It wasn't. Yeah. It was not. It was not very common for for Romans to have yeah. beards. Some of them had them. Uh, Antoninus Pius had it. Here, see, it says actually, uh, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. But see, there's a there's a there's a machloket actually. Which which one here? Um, uh, Yehuda Hanasi. Which Marcus Aurelius? It was. Who who it's talking about? Uh, see, it says. Uh, uh, hold on. Yeah, if, it, if it's this one, then it, yeah, then it's 
See, it says he lived from 121 until 180 CE. But then if you're talking about, uh, what's his face? Um, here, Antonius in the, Antoninus in the Talmud. Um, yeah, however, Antoninus the king did not positive, positive, yeah, positively accept Judaism in its entirety until he had, with the help of a Jewish friend, th th thoroughly investigated its fundamental principles. La, 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 stuff. Oh, see, says, uh, uh, Rabbi also instructed Antoninus concerning the resurrection, which would take place quiet, quite differently from the usual belief, which included even the intact condition of the grave clothes, where the name, and then it's like uh, some kind of source, where the name appears as Antolinus. Antoninus puts questions to Rabbi concerning the cosmos, as for instance, what meaning there is in the sun setting in the West. This is Sanhedrin 91b, as well as questions concerning Judaism proper. In like manner, Antoninus could not see why Jewish law appointed certain hours for prayer, since the latter should be offered at any time that the impulse to devotion was felt. Uh, Rabbi accordingly showed him by an apt illustration, but sometimes on, on the other hand, it was Antoninus who instructed Rabbi making, for instance, the statement that while the unborn child receives its vital principle of conception, the germ, the germ of mentality and its concomitant evil and inclination are received at birth only. Interesting, so Antoninus taught Rebbe that. Yeah, they, uh, they had they 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 had it was a brother type relationship. You know what yeah. I mean? mm -hmm. His alleged conversion. The earlier legend sees Antoninus only the God fearing non Jew, so well inclined towards Judaism that he erected an altar to, to the Jewish God without actually becoming a Jew. Interesting. The later legend, however, regards him as a type of true proselyte, and it is affirmed that the, that at the resurrection he will arise and be the leader of all proselytes. Interesting. The cause of his conversion is said to have been his injury of Rebbe, whether he would be entitled, inquiry, sorry, titled to partake of the Leviathan in the future world. Rab, Rebbe assured him he would he'd be considered worthy, but Antoninus would not believe him, because the law concerning the Paschal Lamb states distinctly that no uncircumcised shall partake of that, of Leviathan. He accordingly entered the covenant of Abraham and became a Jew. What the heck? Did you ever hear this? Uh, uh, I have never heard never heard this before where are you reading this this from uh, uh, you were reading it kind of fast and jewish encyclopedia.com and it gives you sources uh you, yeah uh, no, they, that that's an awesome resource actually yeah by the I way yeah. there's well, i have another 38 very interesting hmm. kohi my strength hmm. it's from uh chapter 31 verse 6 hmm. and it's jacob speaking to his two wives telling them that it's time to leave your father's house. Uh, and he's like, he says, as you know, I have served your father with all of my might. Kohi, mm. my strength. That's 38, okay. Yeah. We're just you know what's crazy? Yeah. In the movie Gladiator, Marcus, like that's the Marcus Aurelius. Yeah. And his son is Commodus, who's a total ladouche. I don't know if that, I mean, if it's that accurate, like. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not that accurate, but that's, that's what, who they're depicting, depicting. And he was like, a, he was a good man, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supposedly a legend. Interesting. No, he was the Tikkun for, for, he was, he probably did like 80% of the Tikkun of Asa. Yeah. You know, and, and then Trump supposed to do the other 20%, basically. Yeah. By the way, you know that the rulers known as the five good emperors were Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, and Marcus Aurelius? What the heck? Who was it? Nerva, Trajan, Dang. and Hadrian. The, like, the guys, Hadrian, like, what the heck? Who, who, really? where, you, where, where did you read this that? This is like a, like a list. It's called the five good emperors. They're, it's, they're, that's how they um, historically known. The term was coined by Nicola Machiavelli and his posthumously oh. published book, The Discourses in Le on Levy. So I guess he considered them five good emperors. Hey, so that's, you know, Machiavelli. Okay, you know. for, for, for Rome, yeah, exactly. I, I didn't think that, you know. Yeah, they weren't like good guys, but I mean. Nero, by the way, right? Nero. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's not clear, by the way, if that, uh, I remember, I remember reading this. It's not clear that if that bust 
really is Nero. Yeah. Or if that's actually what he looked like. Yeah. He was actually maligned. He was hated yeah. Yeah, very, very much by Romans and, yeah. and for, for many, many centuries afterwards. So they, yeah. so they, they, they made a caricature of him yeah. to make him look ugly. Why? Yeah. Well, according to Jewish sources, he actually converted. What? Yeah. So okay. Rome fiddle, fiddles where Nero burns and steigs? Yeah, that was all lie. <laughs> Apparently, that was propaganda. They were trying no, to... Did he convert to Judaism? Or that, or that, he, or that he was fiddling? No, because... Look, they'll never tell you, like, from secular or from the Roman, uh, you know, from the classical historical uh, viewpoint that he... You know, that's purely a Jewish thing. Right. Listen, listen to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to read it. At the end of 66, well, CE, conflict bro broke out between the Greeks and the Jews in Jerusalem and Caesarea. According to the Talmud, Nero went to Jerusalem and shot arrows in all four directions. All the arrows landed in the city. He then asked the passing child to repeat the verse he had learned that day. The child responded, I will lay my vengeance upon a dome by the hand of my people Israel. That's from Yeheskel. Yeah. Nero became terrified, believing that God wanted, to, wanted the second temple to be destroyed but that he would punish the one to carry it out. Nero said he desires to lay waste his house and to lay the blame on me. Whereupon he fled and converted to Judaism to avoid such retribution. Vespasian was then dispatched to put down the rebellion. But Talmud adds that the, aide, the sage Meribalanes lived in the time of the Mishnah and was prominent supporter of Bar Kokhba rebellion against Roman rule. Rabbi Meir was considered one of the greatest Tanaim of the third generation. According to the Talmud, his father was a descendant of Nero who, con who had converted to Judaism. So, Remer Melbanus, his father. His wife, Bruria, yeah. was one of women cited in the Gemara. He, he is the third most frequently mentioned sage in the Mishnah. Roman and Greek sources nowhere report Nero's alleged tri trip to Jerusalem or his alleged conversion to Judaism. There's no, also no record of Nero having any offspring who survived infancy. His only recorded child, Claudia Augusta, died, died aged four months. Yeah, they, 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 basically it's like the erased emperor you know they that yeah. was like a huge like you know uh if the emperor of rome if he got scared of the god of israel and decided to convert yeah. which by the way happened a lot with with big with big shot romans yeah, yeah of course they're all like, over the place in the Gemara. titus and 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 there's like mm -hmm. i think titus uh uh, not Titus, it was Uncle, yeah. who was yeah. the nephew of Titus, right? Yeah. He, he converted, and he converted, like, entire legions of soldiers. Hmm. Yep. Which is shocking. You Look know? at this. Um, this is from an article by Samuel Griswold, uh, I guess, in the history, uh, in Times of Israel. Many don't realize that official became Christian in 330 CE, Jews actively proselytized and attracted converts. The rabbinic Talmud period from 300 BCE to 500 CE was a golden age for conversion to Judaism. Some experts say that the Jewish population grew from 150,000 in 586 BCE to 8 million uh, by the first century CE. To, uh, this was due in large part to conversion. Philo, the Jewish philosopher from Alexandria in the first century CE, es estimates there were 1 million Jews in Egypt or one eighth of the pop total population. Other estimates state approximately 4 million people or 10% of the Roman Empire had converted to Judaism by this time. Flavius Josephus, a Jewish historian of this period, wrote, there is not a city of the Grecians, nor of any of the barbarians, nor any nation whatsoever, whither our custom of resting on the seventh day has not come, and by which our fast and lighting up lamps and many of our prohibitions as to food are not observed. Wow. I think that's because like, there, there are a lot of uh, statements that, for instance, uh, the the Edomites that convert that that converted those were the descendants direct descendants of Asa. So that's like Asa coming back to the family, right? Yeah, sure. Not all of Rome was Asa. Only yeah. only the aristocracy. Yeah. The plebeians were not of Asa. Yeah. Yeah. Please. please. Okay. Um, and also from the barbaric tribes, yeah. there's giant percentages of them were actually lost tribes. Yeah. Like the Goths, it's, especially. It makes sense. It makes sense. So you had these, you had these kind of like waves of return, you know, from the tribes themselves back to 
because it was familiar to them. Mm -hmm. There's something about it, you know, after they lost consciousness of, of their identity, they still had all of these weird customs, like not to eat certain animals or not to mm -hmm. do something on a certain day that nobody, you know, they, they had these customs that, that were recorded, right? Like uh, they, some of them had circumcision, some of them rested on the Sabbath already, you know, it was already a custom. Yeah. But you know, but they and they worshiped a god called Bel. Yeah, interesting. Baal, that's Baal. Yeah, that's, that's why the Israelites were kicked out of uh, of Israel for worshiping Baal. Interesting. And they still held on to it, you know. By the way, this guy Samuel Griswold wrote a book entitled a "New Historical Thriller: True True Identity." Uh, an Israeli Mossad operative working undercover in Iraqi Kurdistan is caught in an explosion during a cross-border raid on, on Kurdish rebels by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. Knocked unconscious, he wakes to find that he has no memory of who he is or why he is there. Will he remember in time to prevent the planned assassination of Ramon Sandoval, the newly elected American president? And why is he receiving strange visions of the Hebrew patriarch Abraham? Is his mind playing tricks on him or are they memories of a previous life? Yes, yeah, uh, Mossad agent who experiences past life visions of being a follower of Hebrew patriarch Abraham while working on the cover in Iraqi Kurdistan. I want to get this book. That's crazy. That is interesting. Yeah, no, I, I heard there, there's something that the Kurds have, they have a they have that they have a tradition like that too. But everybody mm -hmm. kind of does, you know. It's it's, a, it's nowadays like here at the end of at the end of days, you know, when people kind of see the writing on the wall. Everybody's like, yeah, yeah, we're, 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 we're Israelites, we're ancient Israelites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like, where were you when we were getting gassed or getting yeah. our, our heads chopped off by yeah. Cossacks, Mr. Johnny? Well, well, well listen, listen, I think the point is that... Um, I'm talking about the Hebrew Israelites. No, what I'm saying is, where were they? They were probably... They, these people are probably reincarnated from that time. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, like, when I was, when I was in New York... When I was in New York and I'd go to the city very often at Times Square and on the train, I would argue with the Hebrew Israelites, you yeah. know, the black dudes wearing turbans, you know, like that, you know, yeah. with, the whole, with the whole get up, you know, they, yeah. they got the whole costume going on. Yeah. It was like, really? Did you guys, did you guys I, retain I, any of the traditions? Did, did anybody know Hebrew? Okay. So you're using Hebrew words right now. Where do you think that who retained that? Who brought that tradition to you? Was it you? Was it, was it? How, what we we kept it safe for you for when yeah. time came now you can take yeah. over and we should be kicked yes. off the side and that's that's exactly what they said they said yes okay so and also so, if you come to them my a friend of mine came to them on 42nd street and he was like they're, they're screaming out like i'm an educated black man my friend's like yeah really what university did you go to and like none of your business white boy <laughs> I told, you know, I was talking to one of them. I was like, listen, you guys want to be, you know, Jewish. It, you know, it, it's not a, it's not a closed club. Just you can convert. You can become Jewish. Yeah. You don't have to wear the crazy getup. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. just, you know, there's a way to do it. To do what it do right. they say? What do they say to you? Like, no, man, I don't need nothing, man. Yeah. I'm already there, man. Yeah. I feel it. Sure. Of I was course. Like, All right. I don't know, maybe some of these guys one day, you know, they'll wake up and they're like, like they want to be Jewish so badly, you know, that they, yeah. but not only, not only do they want to be Jewish, they, they want to be Jewish and make you not Jewish. Right? Of, course. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Oh man, I, they used to drive me crazy, those guys. I used to argue <laughs> with them all the time. So, uh, you know who drives me crazy now? Ehud Barak, he keeps posting stuff. And you know what I do? I take like, you know, like that the pictures of him coming out of Epstein's building with like that warm hat or whatever he, whatever it was. I just take it and I put it on, on a comment section. You know, can I ask you, can I, can I ask you like, seriously, your opinion? Like I look at, I look at some of these Israeli like politicians, right? Mm -hmm. And, and they have a, like some of them have a reputation for being like famous, like soldiers and, yeah. you know, like, like Spetsnaz, you know, like uh, special forces guys, and I've seen Israeli soldiers in real life. Tall guys, yeah. very, you know, like ripped with muscles, and you know, you know, very, very athletic, and they know how to yeah. fight. But these yeah. guys look nothing like those guys. No, listen, uh, BB was that, 
when he was a young guy. I know. I saw. I saw the picture. BB. Uh, Ehud Barak was more of a brain guy. Uh, what's his name? Ariel Sharon was also more of a brain guy. These people were like, you know. If I'm, I'm excluding Ariel Sharon and yeah. and yeah, Ariel Sharon was actually a true military warrior. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But look at Ben Gantz. He, no, he, ben Gantz was a was a general. I mean, he's he looks like the part, you know. Doesn't look like it. No. He does. Dude, ben Gantz. He, he looks like it. Benny Gantz looks like 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 BB in some kind of like alternate dimension. Ben Gantz, BB, yeah, BB, yeah, Benny Gantz looks like uh, one of those action figure guys. I mean, when he was wearing a uniform. He looks like a twin. He looks like he looks like a know, non, like a non identical twin brother. To, yeah. To Benjamin, it was so weird. Yeah, a little bit. Were, when they were like, you know, prime minister at the same time. You know what I mean? Like, they, they, they never were. It was like. I mean, that, it yeah. looked like it. You know, like it was. Dude, yeah. I got so confused with these five years of these elections that I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It, it to me it was almost like it already happened, and it never happened, right? Yeah, it, it's it's the whole thing's. I'm telling you, I was in Israel at that time. Just balagan. You realize what kind. You realize that like nothing will save this country except for Mashiach. Nothing, nothing. will save the world except for the world. Yeah, but like at the very you know it's like you 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 realize that if at, at the very least we need some sort of Sanhedrin, you know. <laughs> I don't know, dude. There's no, there's no more no more consolation prizes. We need. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. We need Mashiach. I know that. I'm just I'm just saying. You, you see. You see how like there's nothing. I sp- I've been speaking to a lady who you know who's who's. Her friend, she lost a bunch of friends already and a relative to, to COVID. And she's like, please help me to save my friend. He's already in the hospital. Mm-hmm. He has, his, uh, his family is not, part, they're not cooperating, but I'm trying to sneak him some stuff. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, I, I can't really, you know, I can't con- really condone that or, you know, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. But, and she's like, can you just tell me or, or help me understand what the protocol is? So I showed her, I showed her the, uh, the website where the protocol is explained. I mean, that's public knowledge. Anybody can look at that. Yeah. Um, she was trying to save her friend. Okay. And the guy died today. Yeah. So you know, it's been going on for a couple of weeks, you know, and I was like, and there's a couple of things like that that happened today and some stuff like that, that happens every day. And, uh, and there's another dog with its face chewed off. Like there's no more, no more consolation prizes. Like, yeah. Yeah. you understand what I'm saying? Like I'm bringing these hyperbolic examples. Sure. They're not hyperbolic, they're real, actually. So. Yeah. Can I read? Um, I wanted to see if there was any, uh, like, uh, videos about Rabbi Baxt. Like, sometimes, you know, like, I'll check in there's, one there's a ton. There's a, there's a ton of videos. You know, I've seen them all. I just wanted to see yeah. if there's anything new. And mm. the only new thing was, that you know, his funeral. Mm. Yeah. You know? yeah. Bummed me out. And I wanted to see, I don't know if, if it's okay with you. I want, remember that article that we were reading yesterday, that I, you know, with, with the, you know, when we were talking to your friend about Joseph? Yes. Uh, would you mind if I read that? Because it's, you know, just Rabbi Bax. Please. It's, it's, Please. It's, it's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, can you say, can you say something every now and then so I don't think that you're asleep? No, I put you to the yeah. side. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, listen. <laughs> I've been hurt, Greg. I've been hurt before. <laughs> oh, who hurt you? Who hurt will you? Love, when will I love again? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, this, this is an article on a website called cityofluz.com. They recommend Rabbi Joel David Bax. Yeah. Website. Blessing, I mean. And he has a couple of uh, a couple of essays posted there. They're all awesome. Okay. This one is called the revealer of secrets. What does Joseph know that we don't? Okay. Pharaoh, and he starts with a quote. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Tzephenat Paneach, which means revealer of secrets. That's Genesis chapter 41, verse 45. Okay. So in the beginning of the redemption, uh, crucial formulas hidden in the Torah and in the words of the Talmudic sages begin to be revealed. That is a statement by the Gaon of Vilna. Okay. In last week's portion, we read, uh, this was written in 2002, so it's, you know, not current. But in last week's portion, we read, Yosef dreamed the dream 
and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him yet the more. And he said to them, Here, I pray you, this dream which I have dreamed, for behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And my sheaf suddenly arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves came round about and bowed down to my sheaf. So that's from Genesis chapter 37, verse 7. So Yaakov's favorite son, Yosef, brings him critical reports about his brothers. He basically tell on them. Yaakov makes Yosef a fine coat of multicolored woolen strips. Uh, Yosef exacerbates his brother's hatred by recounting prophetic dreams of sheaves of wheat bowing to his sheaf and of the sun, the moon, and the stars bowing to him as well, signifying that all his family will recognize his superiority over them. <laughs> the brothers indict Yosef and resolve to execute him. Uh, and his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Okay, so this is a part of that was a section of Genesis chapter 37, verse 11. But in reality, the brothers thought that Joseph was, that he's going to turn out to be another Asaph. Because, you know, Avraham had a Yishmael, and, and Yisak had an, an Asaph. And both fathers were blind to their sons, by the way. Right? Like Yitzhak was blind to Asaph's, uh, you know, to his, who he really was and what he was doing. And so was Abraham. Abraham didn't want Ishmael to leave. And so they thought the same thing about their father, Yaakov. You know, they thought that because the way he was acting, you know, he, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't doing anything in terms of trying to reassure people that he wasn't Asaph. He was acting weird. So we learned from last week's commentary that Yosef's behavior. And all that followed was part of a cosmic chain of events in an awesome drama, a divine plot engineered to fulfill Avraham's prophecy that his progeny would become enslaved in a foreign land. Yosef is known throughout rabbinical literature as the Sadiq par excellence. But how do we understand the apparent behavior of the 17-year-old Yosef? He appears as an arrogant megalomaniac who caught up in sibling rivalry dreams of dominating his brothers and even his own father right and mother who already passed away you know i mean like it was, it was really it was really vulgar and absurd like the things that he was saying to them or that's the way it seemed to, to, to everybody um you know what i mean because the sun is it represents in the dream represents yaakov and the moon that would be rachel right mm -hmm. so so uh because that 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 is a that's me, that's a metaphor for their anpin and mukva. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So Yosef did not earn the appellation of tzaddik, the saintly one, until a year later, when he was victorious over his sexual inclination uh, against Patiphar's wife. Yet, even at 17 years old, the esoteric tradition teaches that Yosef was consciously preparing for his mission in the role of Tzadik Yesod Olam. The esoteric tradition means the Kabbalah. Okay? So it says, the righteous one is the foundation channel of the world. Okay? So that's a quote. This question is, what, the question is, what did Yosef think he was doing with his relationship to his brothers? You know, who are the tribes of Israel? Did he, like Noah, Avraham, and Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and all the other masters before, before him, have a plan to rectify Adam's damage to the spiritual world? What did Joseph know that we don't know, but are now just beginning to understand? Okay, so in this week's portion, Joseph's secret mission is revealed. Okay, so Pharaoh has a dream. He is displeased with all attempts by his advisors to interpret it. Pharaoh's wine chamberlain, the Saramashkin, right, remembers that Yosef accurately interpreted his dream while in prison. Yosef is released from prison and brought before Pharaoh. He interprets that soon there will begin seven years of abundance, followed by seven years of severe famine, mm -hmm. which actually was worldwide. Yeah. He tells he tells Pharaoh to appoint a wise person to store grain in preparation for the famine. 
and it says, quote, now Pharaoh must seek out a man who is understanding and wise. So the word understanding is Navon. We talked yeah. about that before. Yeah. And, and wise is Chacham, mm -hmm. the word Chachma. So Pharaoh appoints him as viceroy to oversee the project. And he selects Osnat, who was uh, Yosef's uh, ex-master's daughter. Remember, Yosef was sold to this guy, right? Which is, which is the worst name to have if you're in America. But go on. <laughs> wait, you're wait, an Israeli wait. girl living in America. It's the worst name to have. To, to have a what? To have a what? To have the name Osnat. 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 If you're an Israeli girl living in America, the name Osnat is like one of the worst names to have. What, what is it? Why, why, why would they say? Like, I don't understand. What, what is there to make fun of? Oh, snot. Oh, snot? Like, like, it's oh, snot. like snot, like from the nose, snot? Like, yeah. Like, yes, very good. I mean, if you're in kindergarten, like, or in the sixth uh, grade. Like, you'd be surprised, my friend. You'd be surprised. Or mora, Moran. Yeah, that, that's, that, that's a rough one. That, that, that well, snot one. and Moran are the worst two Israeli female names to have in, in America. Or Nimrod. Or Nimrod, yeah, Nimrod, yeah, exactly. Three names. Yeah. Not, anyway. not easy. Okay, but who was Osnat? Who was she? So apparently she was the, the daughter of his previous owner. When Yosef was a slave, he worked as a slave to this guy, Patifera, who was actually the, he was one of the king's advisors, and I think he was like the, I heard he was a. I heard he was a. You you know. A, he was the royal executioner. I heard he he liked Peroni beer. If you know what I mean. Oh no! He yeah. He also desired Yosef. Yeah, he was into Peroni, he was into Peroni beer. Yeah, he was a little fruity. Yeah. 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 Okay. So so when he, like, he, uh, he like woodpecker cider. Anyway, go on. By the way, one of the reasons why he got so mad when his when when his wife you know faked that whole like you know rape attempt. Yeah. Because he was jealous of her. Yeah, oh, that's hilarious. It's like you, you bitch, you whore. Right, he's mine. <laughs> Pretty much, right. <laughs> no, apparently Yosef was the, was the best looking guy who ever lived. Yeah, that I don't know. Like, yeah, yeah. Anyways, he looked like he looked like the guy who played MacGyver in uh, 2016. No, no, no. I'm they, kidding. Basically, apparently we all, we all look like we all look like chimps compared to Yosef. You know what yeah. I mean? Like the whole yeah. world. You know, I thought we look like chimps as it is, you know, whatever, you know. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's that, you know. Like <laughs> George Burns looked a little bit like, you know, I mean, you know, the hair didn't help, okay? You know, <laughs> yeah. And the posture, you know, he could have done something about that. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> why am I picking on George Burns? I actually I have him. no idea. George Burns was a very dear I love that guy. Person. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, who else, you know who else looked a little bit like a chimp, and they, they actually it was like kind of funny. Uh, Johnny Carson, he also had that because Carson looked like a chimp, and Ben, ben Stiller looks like a chimp. Ben Stiller looks like those chimps from uh, two thousand one Space Odyssey. <laughs> no, but no, no. They, but they, there was like an episode on Carson where they actually yeah. you know they brought the animal guys and they brought the yeah. chimp, and he was holding a baby chimp, and they looked alike. Like you know, and you could tell Carson realized it. And he just, he used it, you know what I mean? He's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Anyway, back to the, <laughs> back to the aura. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. All right, so, so, okay. <laughs> By the way, just, just a, a moment of seriousness. My, my, uh, my uncle's in the hospital mm. and I wanted to dedicate. Of course, Lema. Thank you. I wanted to dedicate this to his Rufus Lema. Uh, what's, what's his Hebrew name? Uh, he has a, a Yiddish name. Mm. His, his, his name is Felix. And oh, so it's Rafoil, probably. Well, well, his his Yiddish name is Falik. So that's Rafoil. It is right. I didn't. I didn't. That's my. That's my, uh, my grandfather. He was. He was Felix wow, Falik yeah. Rafoil. Are you serious? Yes. Rafoil. That, that that's actually very like auspicious because he needs a Rafoil. He needs. Yeah. Rafoil needs a Rafoil. I, had, I never. I never put that together. That's Rafoil. That's very interesting. So what's his mother's name? Fira. Rufoil Ben Fira. Or I don't know what her Hebrew name is, but we'll say just Fira. I we think it's Esther, but we're not tired. We're not hundred percent sure. Okay. That's why I say Fira. You, you can just say the name you know. 
It's like in, uh, you know, Congress, Congressman Johnson, the name you know. Yeah. <laughs> that was Eddie Murphy, right? Yes. Yeah. You're a putz of the truck if you don't vote for Congressman Johnson. Hey, you put down time for a ride. What about Congressman Johnson? <laughs> oh, you like them greens? I see you in the greens. I know the goose green, like, like Congressman Johnson, the name you know. <laughs> Keep in yeah, there. Remember yeah. both finger? No, no, we got to learn. We got to learn. I just, this, I'm dedicating yeah. this to. to anyway, go on. Okay. <laughs> like, you know, we'll get through, yeah. we'll get through the article and then. Yes. Okay, fine. All right. So, Lema, Uncle Felix. Okay, so, fear, okay, so Pharaoh has a dream. Okay. Yosef's ex master, mm -hmm. daughter, right? He has a daughter. Her, her name is Osnat. And, and Pharaoh uh, arranges that Yosef should marry her. Okay, what's interesting is that apparently Osnat was not their daughter, not the biological daughter. She was an adopted daughter. Okay, mm -hmm. now this is amazing. She was an adopted daughter. They found two beautiful young girls, like, you know, uh, just wandering around in the desert. And they brought them to the Faro, to Faro and they saw that they were exceptionally beautiful and special. Mm -hmm. So Paro adopted one of them. And Potiphar adopted the other one. Yeah. You know who Paro adopted? Who? Batia. Who? She's the one who she's the one who, who pulled Moshe Rabbeinu out. Oh, of okay. Wow. Okay. And so Osnat was the other. And where do where are these girls from? Mm -hmm. they, were, they were from they were from Yaakov's household. Mm -hmm. They, somehow they ran away or they got lost or they got separated or it's not clear how they ended up there. Yeah. Okay. But that's who Osnat was. Yeah. So everything kind of comes together. Can I pause way. you for a second? Okay. 34 minutes ago, Project Shmeritas released a video entitled Military Documents About Gain of Shmunction Contradict Mousy testimony under oath. Oh, man. Uh, military documents state that Eco Shmiko Health Alliance approached DARPA in March 2018, seeking funding to conduct gain and function research for bat born Shmorona. The proposal named Project Diffuse, which rejected by DARPA over safety concerns and the notion that it violates the gain and function research moratorium. The main report regarding Shmiko Health Alliance proposed leaked. Proposal leaked on the internet a couple of months ago. It has remained unverified until now. Project Veritas has obtained a separate report uh, to the Inspector General uh, of the Department of Defense, written by U.S. Marine Corps Major Joseph Murphy, former DARPA fellow. The proposal does not mention or assess potential risk of GOF. Uh, a direct quote from the DARPA rejection letter. Project Veritas reached out to DARPA for comment regarding the hidden document and spoke with the Chief of Communications, Jared Adams, who said, it doesn't sound normal to me when asked about the way the documents would, were buried. Uh, 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 the never, yeah. It says, Project Veritas has obtained startling number 14 documents regarding the origins of COVID-19, gain of function, vaccines, potential treatments which have been suppressed and the government's effort to conceal all of this. Uh, it goes on, da -da, da -da -da, research, and now here we go. Uh, Dr. Malsey was repeatedly maintained under oath, oath that NIH and NA whatever had not been involved in gain of function with Eagle Health but according to documents obtained by Veritas, which outlined da da da, -da DARPA, da da da. I want to get to the part about what's his face, here? our friend uh, that screwed your brother. Uh, it doesn't mention any. Oh, maybe they'll continue with Dajak later. This is just a military thing. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. Let's play this. If you can hear it. Senator, with all due respect, I disagree with so many of the things that you've said. You're still unwilling to admit that they gained in function, they gained in lethality. According to the definition that is currently operable, we're not going to get anywhere close to trying oh, to up. prevent another. Yeah, what's up? You said something? No, I didn't say anything. Oh, okay. I thought you, I thought you... Lab leak. Project Veritas has obtained never before seen military documents regarding the origins of COVID-19, gain of function oh, research, sure vaccines, sure. potential treatments which have been suppressed, and the government's effort to conceal all of this. 
Dr. Anthony Fauci has testified many times before Congress stating that the U.S. government was never involved in gain-of-function research at the screen? Wuhan Institute of Virology. Yeah. Will you today finally take some responsibility for funding gain-of-function research in Wuhan? Senator, with all due respect, I disagree with so many of the things that you've said. Gain, first of all, gain of function is a very nebulous term. But the thing is, is you're still unwilling to admit that they gained in function when they say they became sicker. They gained in lethality. It's a new virus. That's not gain of function. According to the definition that is currently <laughs> operable, we're not going to get anywhere close to trying to prevent another lab leak of this dangerous sort of experiment. You won't admit wow. that it's dangerous, and for that lack of judgment, I think it's time that you resign. You have said that I am unwilling to take any responsibility for the current pandemic. I have no responsibility for the current pandemic. That assertion is based on the NIH's definition of gain of function. However, the documents we've obtained refute that. The documents in question stem from a report at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, better known as DARPA, which were hidden in a top secret share drive. But what is DARPA? They are an agency under the US Department of Defense, which facilitates research and technology with potential military applications. Dr. Stephen Walker was the director of DARPA at the time of the EcoHealth Alliance proposal. A source sent us this video of Dr. Walker talking about research they were exploring related to mRNA technology and its potential application with military personnel in the field. DARPA, about five, six years ago, we set up an office called the Biotechnology Office. And the real purpose of that was to understand how biology worked and then build design, uh, design build, and test cycles where you could um, engineer microorganisms to do things that you want to do. Though the main report regarding the EcoHealth Alliance proposal leaked on the internet a couple of months ago, it has remained unverified until now. Project Veritas has obtained a separate report to the Inspector General of the Department of Defense, written by the U.S. Marine Corps Major Joseph Murphy, a former DARPA fellow. Major Murphy makes claims in his report to the Inspector General that, if true, could be damning to the official narrative that has been played out to the world over the past two years. Major Murphy's report states that EcoHealth Alliance approached DARPA in March 2018, seeking funding to conduct gain-of-function research of bat-borne coronaviruses. The proposal was named Project Diffuse. DARPA rejected the proposal because the work was too dangerous and could violate the gain-of-function moratorium, despite EcoHealth's position that it would not. According to the documents, the NIAID, under the direction of Dr. Fauci, did not reject the proposal. They went ahead with the research at Wuhan and several sites across the U.S. Dr. Fauci yes. has repeatedly maintained his position under oath that the NIH and NIAID have not been involved in gain of function research with the EcoHealth Alliance program. This appears to be contradictory to Major Murphy's analysis and the rejection from the Biologics Office at DARPA. Major Murphy's report goes on to detail great concern over the COVID-19 gain-of-function program, the concealment of documents, the suppression of potential curatives like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, Incredible. and the mRNA vaccines. Incredible. To be clear, Major Murphy is not the source of our reporting. As far as we're aware, he has done nothing that violates his oath of service to our country. We were able to track him down, and though he couldn't go into detail about the hidden documents, he did offer this heartfelt statement. I offer no comment on the investigation or internal Marine Corps no. deliberations. I offer a brief comment to those that desire answers and guy. to those that withhold them. To yeah. those seeking answers, I offer encouragement. There are good people striving for the truth, working together in and out of government, and they succeed. To those that withhold, I pray for you. Well, Find the moral courage to come forward. Unbelievable. Don't let a lie be our legacy to posterity. Unbelievable. People will forgive. A commitment to truth is in the heart of this nation. Semper Fi. Project Veritas reached out to DARPA for comment regarding the hidden documents and spoke with the Chief of Communications, Jared Adams. It doesn't sound normal to me. No, like I said, if, it, if something resides in a classified setting, then it should be appropriately marked. I'm not at all familiar with unmarked documents that reside in a classified space. No. Um, that, like I said, that good practice to put unmarked materials in, um, you know, in, a, in a classified space, but there may be, there may be
be cause to because um, something is determined to be classified, um, but it wasn't you know, originally marked appropriately. I'd be happy, Robert, honestly, to investigate and you know, talk to the people who would own this document within the agency, ideally the, you know, the director of the biological technology office, the deputy director of that office, and try to ascertain you know, why it was the case. So here's the question. If the Department of Defense, the same people who make our nuclear arsenal, felt this research was too dangerous to proceed with, why in the world did the NIH, NIAID, and EcoHealth Alliance recklessly disregard the risks involved? Did they purposefully change the definition of gain of function in order to bypass the moratorium? Further, who at DARPA made the decision to bury the original report that could have raised red flags to the Pentagon, the White House, or Congress, which may have prevented this entire pandemic that has led to the deaths of 5.4 million people worldwide, caused much pain and suffering to many millions more. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. What can we say? Oh, hold on, I gotta, I gotta mute myself. Just give me one second. Just give me one second. Hello. Nope. Sorry about that. Not Family stuff. Uh, amazing, right? That's incredible. Let's talk about it. I, I just want to. Fin- I want to finish the reading. Yeah. Though, please, please. Or you know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hang on. I'm just looking for the section. Okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> this is a uh, a new section of the of the article. So. It says Yosef. Redeemer of Wisdom. This is from mm-hmm. the Kabbalah tradition of the Gona of Roma. Yosef, the righteous tzaddik, mm-hmm. first to attain the archetypal levels of Bina and Chachma. This is a mystery. This is the mystery of the verse, quote, my sheath suddenly arose and stood upright. That's from Genesis chapter 37, verse 7. Yosef understood but the essence of his dream and vision concerned these two levels. He saw it as an indication of his great mission. He was to become the conduit, the Yisod, for revealing the supernal Pachpa and Bina. Okay, these are Sfirot. This is why he later said to Paro, he said, quote, now Paro must seek out a man who is understanding, Navon, from the same root as Bina and wise, Chacham, which is Fachma, obviously, okay? So he just basically said to to Pharaoh, he said, you have to seek out a a person, a man who is, uh, resonates with Sphira of Bina and Chachma. So right, it's right in the text. But he was also, in, in reality, when he was speaking to him, he was referring to himself, he just didn't say it outright. So he mentioned understanding Bina before Chachma, wisdom, because this took place prior to the giving of the Torah, um, the Torah, which being the highest supernal level of, of Chachma, of wisdom. So it is for this reason that after the giving of the Torah, Chachma, wisdom, precedes Bina, understanding, as it says in the verse, quote, she is your wisdom and your understanding in the eyes of the nations. This great nation is certainly a wise and understanding people, unquote. That's from 
uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6. According to tradition, Yosef attained these levels, wisdom and understanding. Uh, he did it in the following manner. The night before Yosef's release from prison, if you recall he was in prison for 12 years, right? he was taught the 70 languages of the 70 nations of the world by the archangel Gabriel. And he was also taught the seven wisdoms, which, are, which means the sciences, okay? By the archangel Metatron, okay? All in the night before he met, before he met Paro. When, when Yosef had recounted his dreams to his brothers, he made sure to include their interpretations, namely that they indicated his superior understanding and wisdom. This, of course, was the main reason for their jealousy, as the verse states, quote, they hated him even more for his dreams and his words. That was from chapter 37, verse 8 of Genesis. So his words refers to the interpretation that he gave to his dreams. Okay, so our master, the Gaon of Vilna, found an allusion to this. The phrase, quote, my sheaf arose, which in Hebrew is kama alumati, okay? uh, is numerically, it's the same gematria as the term for sheva hachmot. You follow me, Greg? I'm listening to you, man. Kama, kama alumati is the same gematria as sheva hachmot, the seven wisdoms. Mm -hmm. Our master, so remember, kama alumati is what he said to his brothers, right? My sheaf arose. Yeah. Right? And that's the same as the seven wisdom. So there's that mathematical connection there, uh, alluding to what the Vilna Gaon is explaining to us here. So our master revealed another amazing illusion that indicates Yosef's link with wisdom and understanding, with Chachma and Bina. So during the exodus from Egypt, Moshe took Yosef's bones with him, for Yosef had bound the children of Israel by an oath. He said, God will surely redeem you. You shall therefore bring my bones out of here with you. So that was a quote from Exodus chapter 13, verse 90. So the second letter in each word of the verse, Moshe took Yosef's bones with him. They add up to the numerical value of the phrase, the seven wisdoms, Sheva Chachmot. Okay. So if you look at that Pusik, you want to look at that Pusik? Open up 13, mm -hmm. 13, 19. Um, Exodus 13, 19. So this, 13. this is, okay. Uh, but this is what? Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Right, but in the Hebrew, so, so hold on. Oh, uh, hold on. Uh, so, this is Safari. I just, the problem is Safari that, you know, I don't know, actually you have it. Uh, so, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Moshe et at at Yosef Yosef Imoki Hash Hashbea. Is that what I'm reading? Uh, one second. Moshe et Bnei. Vayikach Moshe et Atzmot Yosef Imo. Yosef Imo. Ki 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 Hashbea Hishbia et Bnei Israel. So basically, if you took the second letter of each word. Mm -hmm. In this verse, mm -hmm. the numerical value of that is equivalent to the term Sheva Chachmot, the seven mm -hmm. wisdoms. Yeah. Okay, now why the middle letters? Why not the, because the middle, the, the letters that are in the middle, right? Not the first and not the last. Mm -hmm. okay? It's the second letter, right? So mm -hmm. that is related to the idea of bones. That's the mm -hmm. inner, the, like the, the, the inner foundation of mm -hmm. something, right? Mm -hmm. So this idea, the seven wisdoms, as it pertains to bones, the bones of Yosef. Yeah. Okay? So it's not fully clear yet, but there's a connection between this inner wisdom, these seven of, of these seven wisdoms, and Yosef's bones. So they definitely took Yosef's actual bones with them, but what Yosef's bones really means is the secret seven sciences mm -hmm. that 
that he that he taught yeah. he took that with them that's what it really means okay that's that's what this that's what it's saying here okay so okay so uh let's see just get back to the text okay so the second letter in each word of the verse moshe took yosef's bones with him the same verse that we just read adds up to the numerical value of the phrase sheva Pachmot, seven wisdoms okay now since yosef is the archetype of the Mashiach of the beginning of the re- of of the of the redemption process, right? All mm-hmm. this indicates that the revelation of the secret wisdom of the Torah will come about primarily through the through the actions of Mashiach ben Yosef during the period of the of what's called the Ikveta de Mashiach. Footsteps, the footsteps of Mashiach. Together with the ingathering of the exiles, this will signal the period of the beginning of the redemption, which is, there's a term for that, Adhalta de Giula. Okay, these are, these are Aramaic terms. Yeah. Okay, so as for the folks at home, I know you know. So according, yeah. according to the Gaon of Vilna's doctrine of redemption, all scientific knowledge and technology is rooted in the providential force of Mashiach ben Yosef. I'll read that again. According to the Gaon of Vilna's doctrine of redemption, mm-hmm. all scientific knowledge and technology is rooted in the providential force of Mashiach and Yosef. Mm-hmm. He is the essence yeah. of knowledge and the organizing and unifying principle that governs the development, the redemption, and the integration of scientific and spiritual knowledge together. Okay, he reunites them. Okay, all details of this great mission are embodied in the life of the historical Yosef, which means that if you study Yosef in 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 the scripture, right, and you study his life and all the things that happened to him carefully, mm-hmm. you will find the pattern that will uh, that will it, it'll mimic the pattern of well, it's actually the other way around. Mashiach ben Yosef's life will mimic the pattern of Joseph. Okay? Yeah. So, okay, so all the details of this great mission are embodied in the life of the historical Joseph. From the dreams of his youth, his sail into slavery, his rise to power as Pharaoh's viceroy, his mastery of the seven wisdoms, and the recovery of his bones at the critical moment of the Exodus. Every event in Joseph's life is a prophetic illusion to the task of Mashiach ben Yosef. Okay, the appellation of tzaddik, right? When someone's called a tzaddik, the righteous one. Yeah. This is associated primarily with the ninth sphera, which is Yesod. Right? And it is personified by Yosef. Okay? Yosef is a sphera, like, like uh, Avraham is, is a sphera of test. Yeah. And Yitzhak is the Gevura, if you keep going down. Can you just give me one second? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can you just give me one second? I'm sorry. Yeah, sure, sure. Sorry about that. Not a problem. All right. So, okay. all right. So, so the appellation of Tzadik, the righteous one, is associated primarily with the ninth sphera of Yesod. Okay. And it is personified in Yosef. He earned this title only after he was successful in overcoming the sexual temptations of Patifera's wife. His righteousness is due to his almost superhuman ability to channel his sexual energy throughout this ordeal. This is the Kabbalistic meaning of the phrase, Sadiq Yesod Olam, the righteous one who is the hidden channel of the world. Okay? Yet, Yosef earned himself the title of Sadiq, the righteous channeler for another reason that is not any less significant. 
Also, for this reason, he was crowned with the additional title of Safnat Paneach, which is the revealer of hidden things. That's what, that's what Pharaoh called him. Yosef had entered into the pardes, the orchard of the Egyptian occult wisdom. He entered it in peace, but he also left in peace, which is a big, a big surprise. Okay, so um, there is a well-known saga of the four sages who entered the Pardis. This is from the Talmud, right? Um, the Orchard of Wisdom. Of these four spiritual masters, only Rabbi Akiva, quote, entered in peace and left in peace. That's from the Talmud volume called Hagiga uh, on page 14 on the B side. Okay, According to the Kabbalah, it is not by chance that, they were, that there were precisely four men involved in the story. The word pardes is itself an anagram for the four levels of Torah exploration. Okay? The first is pshat. As you know, it means the, the simple meaning, right? The, what is it? The surface meaning of, of, of the text. Yeah. Yeah. And remez is, is the hint, the, the, the allusion. Mm -hmm. alluding to things then then you have drash yeah. which is the exposition and then at the end you have sod which is the mystery so pshat remez drash and sod they create the acronym pardes okay so um second that's three yeah okay so these four levels in turn parallel the four letters of the tetragrammaton which is yud hey vav hey four letter uh, name of God, okay? And it parallels the four dimensions of the spiritual universe. So you have Atsilut, Beria, Yetzira, and Asiya. So Atsilut means emanation. Beria is the world of creation. Mm -hmm. Yetzira is the world of formation. And Asiya yeah. is the world of action. That's the world that we are in. The encounter with the fourfold dimensionality of the Pardes is none other than the re-entry into the mystery of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. The objective of entering the Pardis is to rectify the fall of knowledge, okay, which happened both the spiritual wisdom as well as secular wisdom, which had occurred in the time of Adam. Okay, So as these men were preparing themselves to enter into the Pardis, their intention was to contemplate the deepest inner secrets of the four universes, and to ascend from every external level to the inner level above it. The first level that one must master in order to enter the pardes consists of knowledge of the physical dimension, okay? Which is yeah. the heaven and earth of this world. This involves the analytical wisdom that distinguishes all true science. All of this, however, is only the external aspect of lower dimensionality. Which, which we call the world of Asiya, which, which is the domain of the science. So the inner aspect of this, of this is the vital force. We know it as the nefesh, right? The nefesh is the primary currency of, of the universe, by the way. The nefesh, which it sustains nature and it activates it uh, continually, okay? So this was exactly Yosef's test in Egypt. Yosef the Tzaddik also entered into this exploratory mission. He also was victorious and departed entirely in peace. By the way, uh, Rabbi Akiva is known as uh, Akiva ben Yosef. Yeah. Interesting. As Zohar, as it says in the Zohar in uh, chapter 3 on page 207a, it says, when Yosef was separated from his father and sold into slavery at the age of 17, he was already initiated into the supernal wisdom. It, he was already initiated in the mystery of the holy supernal crowns, the Sephiroth. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, he learned their occult wisdom in the mystery of the lower crowns. Okay? That is, he learned how the Sephiroth of the right side of supernal wisdom are united with those on the left side of the lower wisdom. The 10 on the right are called, are called uh, there's a code word that the Torah uses for them as donkeys. Okay, the 10 on the right are called donkeys. 
male donkeys, while the 10 on the left are called uh, female donkeys. Okay? In Hebrew, they have, each one has their own word. <laughs> okay? So Yosef, Yosef thus secretly alluded to his father what he had learned while in Egypt when, quote, this is, this is from the text, yeah. he sent 10 donkeys loaded with Egypt's finest produce, as well as 10 she donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father's journey. That's from Genesis 45, 23. So the 10 male donkeys and the 10 female donkeys were a message to Jacob. And Jacob knew exactly what they meant. He meant that, 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 that Joseph was able to take the spiritual knowledge that he had uh, from the higher realms and, rec and, and connect it to the lower knowledge of the Egyptians. Okay? And that's very, very difficult because yeah. uh, most people can't make it out of there with their souls intact. Yeah. So this is what Yosef's brother meant when they told their father, quote, Yosef is still alive. Yeah. He is ruler over the entire land of Egypt. So that's from Genesis uh, uh, 45, uh, or actually 44, I think, verse 26, or from chapter 26, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Their intention, their, the brother's intention, jo Joseph's brothers, right, the tribes, when they're speaking to Joseph, their, inten uh, their intention was that Joseph had subjugated the hierarchy of the external knowledge of ancient Egypt, okay? The next verse, therefore, states, Yaakov's heart became faint, for he could not believe them. Right? Finally, Israel, who was Yaakov, said, it is too much. My son Yosef is yet alive. And then it says, Yaakov, Yaakov Israel, right? That's, that was his name, was shocked at the astounding degree of Yosef's righteousness in that he was still on the level of high, which, is, which means life. Which, which really means the uncontaminated life force, the nefesh, as is explained in the Holy Zohar. So basically what he's saying is that Jacob didn't necessarily think that Yosef was physically dead, like most people think, okay? He, he knew that he, he had ended up in Egypt, right? But he was basically as good as dead, spiritually, his soul, because he didn't think that Yosef could, could survive in that environment yeah. with uh, unscathed uh, because, well, I mean, you have to, we have to have a conversation about what the environment was like there. So when, when his children, when his other sons came to Jacob and said, Joseph is alive, that's what they meant. They meant to say that Joseph, he conquered that place. He was not brought down spiritually. In fact, he reined it in. Somehow he was able to control it and to use it for good somehow. So that's what that's really what the what, what the verse says. Joseph is still alive. Mm -hmm. So old Joseph high, right? So the occult wisdom of ancient Egypt that Joseph had mastered was not theoretical magic. The wisdom of Egypt was based upon a broad and penetrating understanding of the forces of physical nature. Okay, the deepest part of physics. Okay, the ancient Egyptians, they, by the way, on a side note, they got, they went much further than, than we are now. Yeah. It's hard for people to, to really imagine that, but uh, not if you study the ancient structures. In fact, oh, he, he actually says it here. In fact, one example of ancient Egyptian mastery of the seven wisdoms is none other than the last remaining of the ancient world's quote unquote, uh, seven wonders. Okay. So. 10 miles west of, of the city of Cairo lies an object that has intrigued and bewildered historians, philosophers, and scientists for many centuries. The only remaining of the traditional seven wonders of the ancient world, the Great Pyramid of Giza, is often described as the most sublime landmark in history. Yeah. The base of this massive structure covers 13 acres or if you can imagine seven midtown New York City blocks, yeah. basically a square mile, leveled. Yeah. Now, here's the really amazing part. 
level to within a fraction of an inch. Yeah. Okay? Actually, even less. Okay. That means that the platform that they built, which is a mile square, it's crazy, is uh, for the pyramid, not even the pyramid itself. We didn't get to the pyramid yet. Just the platform yeah. is perfectly flat. Mm -hmm. They can't do that nowadays. They can't make an area that big perfectly flat. That's makes impossible. You wonder, makes you wonder how they did, how they, they did it. Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So it was leveled within a, a few fractions of an inch, more than two and a half million blocks of limestone, okay, of, uh, and granite, weighing from two to 70 tons a piece. Okay. They rise in 201 stepped tiers. To the, to the height of a modern 40-story building. As a feat in masonry, it was not to be matched until the construction of the Boulder Dam. Okay. Modern engineers are astounded by both the enormity of the problems involved in the construction of the pyramid and the opticians' precision with which these problems were resolved. Okay. Uh, what the Great Pyramid looked like when it was completed, or even for the first or second millennia, thereafter is not recorded in history. Furthermore, it is not agreed upon when it was built or even by whom and for what purpose it was constructed. Okay, so, so, so two things are certain, however. It was never used as a tomb, unlike the smaller pyramids, and it was already ancient by the time of the Exodus from Egypt, which is 3,334 years ago. It was already ancient at that time. Yeah. So it is well known that the masters of the ancient seven wisdoms, Jews and non-Jews also, saw no division <laughs> between spiritual truth and science. Okay? Nothing was ever secular to begin with. Yeah. All knowledge was seen as being rooted in a divine source, mm -hmm. even if this knowledge was misunderstood and misused for idolatrous purposes. Can I quickly read a just a very fast quote from Nikola Tesla? You probably heard this please, quote. Please, please. The day science begins to study non-physical phenomena is it will make more progress in one decade than in all the previous centuries of its existence. So it's, preci it's precisely what the Egyptians were doing. That's what, that, yeah, and that's what hopefully we're gonna be doing again, but in a rectified manner. Yeah. So it is not by coincidence that alchemy is the precursor to modern chemistry. Yeah. Uh, also, what they called astrology laid the foundations for what we call now astronomy, and then mystic geometry, which actually most people call it sacred geometry now, preceded present day mathematics. Okay? Yeah. And in the time of Yosef, Egypt was the center of all scientific and even spiritual knowledge. Uh, even though it was idolatrous in that time, okay? They, that, that was the capital of it. Mm -hmm. okay. As the Mashiach ben Yosef of his generation, right? <laughs> Yosef, because there's, there's one in every generation. So Yosef's mission, the original Yosef from the Bible, his mission was to amass and integrate the lower wisdom together with the higher wisdom into a unity of supernal wisdom. Okay, similar to King Solomon, at the ascendancy of his wisdom and power, Yosef was compelled against his will to enter into the pardes of Egyptian <laughs> occult wisdom in order to redeem the sparks of higher knowledge, the fragments of higher knowledge that had mm. become separated from their source and mixed with the shells of impurity. Yosef's messianic role was to, quote, to distill from their words that which they have swallowed. I want to see where that quote is from. Hold on. That is from, oh, that's from, uh, that's, the Vilma, that's the Vilma Dawn who said that. Um, yeah, they, they source it there. What did you say? No, this is, there's a source there. There's a, I'm reading it. There's a, yeah. A gra to a rabbi, Dr. Oh, Baruchik. No, but, right. Uh, he wrote about it, but the, the gra yeah. is going Rabbi Eliyahu, the, the Vilma yeah. Dawn. Yeah. Yosef, so Yosef succeeded. In his mission. Have you ever heard any other Lubavitcher talk about the Vilna Gaon this much? <laughs> Maybe only Rabbi Schloss. <laughs> okay. That's it. Oh, right. And it's only because he grew up Litvak. Right. And yeah. also um, uh, Rabbi Weisberg. Yes. 
I hope we didn't. I hope we didn't lose. Uh, you know, hope about having him on. But anyway, so no, we didn't. Said, you, what did you say? I said we did not. We were. We are going to try. All right. So Yosef succeeded, not on this show though. On your show, on the Rogue, on the Rogue uh, Greg podcast. The, because the, we, curse, the, the, we curse too much on this show. And the, the, gro- the, gro- the Grog. The Grog. Yeah. Okay. So Yos. Okay. So Yosef succeeded in his mission to such an extent. <laughs> that even the Egyptians, uh, Pharaoh, and the priests of the occult, and the chief architects recognized mm-hmm. uh, his superiority, meaning they recognized Yosef's superiority, and they gave him a new name, Tefnat Paneach, the revealer of hidden things. That means he mastered their occult knowledge so yeah. well that he showed, them, he showed them some stuff that they didn't know yeah. <laughs> about their own, okay? So mm-hmm. he was appointed uh, viceroy over all of Egypt, then, which was then the center of world uh, civilization. Along mm-hmm. with being the master of Torah and its esoteric teachings, Yosef was the master of the natural sciences. He was a virtual Einstein, okay? Um, he was the master of dream interpretation, which is, you, can, you know, it's akin to psychology, okay? And he is also the master of uh economics uh so so you know basically um he you know he was a renaissance man so all this and yet od yosef Chai, right this word this term od yosef Chai, joseph still lives right so mashiach ben yosef was still alive that's that, that was another way of understanding it so yosef looked he looked actually like a non-Jew. He wore Egyptian clothing. He talked like, like an Egyptian. And, and, and he feigned this before his brothers. Uh, and he, he pretended that he didn't understand Hebrew when his brothers were in front of him speaking to each other. He was ostensibly married to uh, what seems to be a, a non-Jewish uh, woman, Asnat, right? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and Joseph even had a distinctly non-Jewish name, right? Which, which the pharaohs, pharaoh gave him, Tefnat Saf, Paneach. Yet, shocking even his father, Yaakov Yisrael, the mission impossible of Mashiach ben Yosef was accomplished. Although appearing to have been killed on the outside, uh, which there's a term, a Kabbalistic term, uh, which is called, there's a tradition, which is called Mashiach ben Yosef will die. Mm-hmm. Um, he had only gone underground Okay, which means Mashiach ben Yosef lives on and resurfaced untainted. Okay, it is his ability to extract and to process and to integrate secular wisdom that Yosef earned the title of Tzaddik Yisod Olam, Mm -hmm. the righteous one who is the hidden spiritual channel for the seven wisdoms. Okay, as revealed to him, keep reading. I just gotta, I just gotta turn the heat up. Okay. As revealed to him in his dreams, this was his destiny. And this is the destiny of every Mashiach ben Yosef uh, in every generation. Okay? And it is the mission of those God-fearing bearers of the Torah who attach themselves to his collected loot. We'll talk about that in a moment. Mm-hmm. It, is, it is from the archetype of Yosef that the mission of Mashiach ben Yosef derives in every generation. This is especially true during the period of the final footsteps of the Mashiach, the Ikveta de Mishach, which we are, which probably we already passed. Okay? Yeah. Taking, the, taking the alias of Safnat Paneach, Yosef, the Jewish physicist, psychologist, economist, extracted the fallen sparks from the science and technology of this foreign culture, which mm-hmm. while it was directing its very path. So Yosef's task in Egypt was nothing less than a messianic uh, conspiracy. And the task today of Mashiach ben Yosef is also nothing less than laying the groundwork for a worldwide messianic conspiracy. Interesting choice of words. There is yet another aspect to Joseph's role as, mm-hmm. as he was coined by the Egyptians, Safnat Paneach, right? Again, that means the revealer of hidden things. So this was the name... Like we said before, it was the name given to Joseph. It signifies that one of the missions of Mashiach ben Yosef is to reveal the secrets 
of the Torah in every generation. As is known, this is especially true uh, at the Ikhleted, as the Ikhleted the Mishecha, the footsteps of Mashiach approach. Okay. Now, the mission of Mashiach ben Yosef is to reveal both the secrets of the physical universe and the secrets of the spiritual universe. According to the law of parallelism, mm -hmm. the former is the very reflection of the latter. Meaning every, there's everything that we see here in the physical universe, there's, a cor there's something corresponding to it in the spiritual realms. As Yosef's sheaf arose to reveal the seven wisdoms uh, 3,500 years ago, so has the great sheaf of Mashiach ben Yosef been rising again, reaching a new ascendancy of power and dominance that grows more awesome each day. Although science and technology appear from a simple religious perspective as a skeleton of heresy and apicorsis, which means heresy, <laughs> every, every one of these bones, right? Remember the bones will be resurrected and redeemed. Okay? Yeah. Just interesting. Uh, okay. Moshe, again, back to that quote, Moshe took Yosef's bones with him. For Yosef had bound the children of Israel by an oath, saying, God will surely redeem you. You shall therefore bring my bones out of here with you. Unquote. Our master revealed, that, that means the Vilna Goan, that the second letters in each word of the verse, Moshe took Yosef's bones with him, add up to the numerical value of the phrase, the, the, the seven wisdoms. Okay, so we, we read that before too. Okay, when Moshe... Uh, who actually was the Mashiach ben Yosef of his generation, uh, when he will take Yosef's bones with him, uh, that means back into his soul, okay? they will then arise and resurrect with the flesh and heart of a spirituality the world has not ever known. And, when the, and, and then when the Yosefs of today, which are the scientists and the technicians, when they will be redeemed, Secular wisdom will be turned outside in to reveal a vision of creation that will be more than, re than religion and more than science. Okay? The tree of knowledge will be transformed into the tree of life. The key to understanding the messianic mission of Yosef in every generation is a scriptural formula. Also from this week's portion. Okay? And it says, and Yosef recognized his brothers. But they did not recognize him. Okay. So the collective soul of Yosef, the divine conduit for the reunification of Adamic knowledge, is here on a mission. Okay. Tsofnat Panea, the revealer of secrets, is hidden in the zeitgeist of our generation. Our generation's challenge is to put the pieces of the puzzle together and to understand the secrets that Mashiach ben Yosef has come to reveal. Yet, even though he recognizes who we are, the question remains, can we recognize him? Interesting. This is written 20 years ago. Wow. Amazing. Listen, there are some people who understand what's going on, you know, years in advance. Yep. They understand that. And, uh, you know, it's interesting, this week's Parsha is the splitting of the sea. And I feel like we got to talk about this. So what do you what do you think of these documents, these DARPA documents that basically show, I mean, I mentioned this to you yesterday and we wondered, are, are people going to care? Yeah, that, that's the question. It's, it's nice to have all this information, but out there. But are people going to care? Is something going to be done about this? It's, it's, it, it, it. Knowing is one thing. Doing. I think that, you know, I, I keep, I keep uh, deferring back to my statement that we're going to need the marshmallow man to get people yeah. to, to actually care. It's people are just like, a, it's just asleep. They need something shocking, you know? Just shocking. More than, more than human shocking. They need something that really is not is not part of their yeah, normal daily. experience in this world. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
that's that's what I that's what I'm, I'm hoping for every moment. Yeah. Okay. So this I don't want to add. What worldwide Bayesian causal impact analysis? Where is this? Where was this written? Oh, this is like a private thing. Uh, some Canadian analysis about like deaths. Uh, whatever. I'm trying to find something like interesting that's like groundbreaking. I don't know. Uh, oh my God, Nancy Pelosi looks like she, her eyebrows were raised to the sky. Yeah, man, oh, here we go. <laughs> Looks like Jake, listen to this. Jake Tapper and Sanjay Gupta start to finally ask questions that rationally minded people were asking 20 months ago. Get really ready to see a lot of people flip on, on Shmovid. This is all about being to be exposed and they're trying to better position themselves for when this happens. Yeah, they want to look in the good. Yeah, no, they 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 see the writing on the wall. They want yeah. to they could salvage yeah. their careers. Mm -hmm. But they won't be able to see. Uh they backed the wrong pony. This guy wrote, what would the new game plan for mainstream media be? Downplaying Shmovin entirely, and there, here are the main reasons why. Get the attention off of Joe, I will shut down the virus, Biden, for his monumental failure. Two, influence people to forget about Fauci, Dajak, and Barrett, knowingly phoning Shemaine no function. Lying about it under oath, under oath, U.S. helping China create a global bioweapon isn't a good look. Three, hope people will stop talking, effectively, uh, talking about effective early treatment. They do not want people looking into just how far mainstream media, Biden, CDC, who NIH went to sabotage and downplay HCQ, IVM, especially after uh, cover up gets exposed, gain of function cover up gets exposed. Regardless, these are exciting times. The only thing stopping this from getting exposed would be US starting and or getting involved in a foreign war. So expect us to go to war soon. Uh, listen to this. Uh, Andrew Huff, some guy named Andrew Huff. Pursuant to Free Information Act, I hear a request the following records. To whom it may concern, my name is Andrew Huff, and I'm working with the House Select Committee on Intelligence with Mr. Ravi Batra, Ravi Batra Law, related to the investigation into the origin of COVID. For the past two months, I've been under constant surveillance in all forms. My house has been broken into. Hard drives have been stolen. Electronic eavesdropping equipment has been installed throughout my home. All my electronic devices have been hacked with drones, culminating with being attacked in my house with microwaves from an aircraft. This is due to revealing Due to me revealing that Dajak, Peter Dajak, EcoHealth stated that to me that was that he was working with the CIA. Letter stating these facts have been sent to directors, leadership of FBI, DHS, Justice, House, Senate, and Tel committees, and also Governor of Michigan and AG Nessel, Attorney General Nessel. I request all records and information pertaining to investigation of myself, Mr. Ravi Batra, my company MTRX Incorporated, MTRX employees, and my wife Emily Huff, including the total amount of U.S. taxpayer dollars spent on any and entire surveillance operation to, the, to these of these people or entities. The requested documents will be made available to the general public and this request is not being made for commercial purposes. In the event that these are these are fees, I would be grateful if you inform me of the total charges in advance of fulfilling my request. I prefer the request filled, filled electronically by email attachment of available or, available or CD-ROM if not. Thank you in advance for your anticipated cooperation in this matter. I look forward to receiving your response to this request within 20 business days. As the statute requires. Who is Dr. Andrew Huff? Let's take a look. Who is this person? This was on December 15th request about Mr. Dajak. Dr. Andrew Huff is uh, let's take a look. Andrew L. Huff, Washington. Where are you, re where are you reading this? This is in a Telegram group. Somebody okay. posted this. Uh, uh, psychiatry and for forensic psychiatry, aerospace medicine, and L, L. Andrew Huff, DC. Uh, psychotherapy, medication management, forensic psychiatry, Federal Aviation Administration. I oh, he's certified. Uh, he's got his own practice. Harvard Public School of Public Health. What uh, interesting. L. Andrew Hoff, Silver Spring, Maryland. Is this the guy? I'm not sure. I don't know. Very interesting. Who did he write this to? He wrote this to someone. Uh, let's take a look. Ravi Batra. Take a look. There you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
some letter that was written by this guy. Not sure. Oh, here we go. A Andrew Huff, PhD, something. Hold on. Oh, come on. Uh, doesn't look like anything I can find. Good, sir. You know, it's one thing we can say we're about to see something. It's quite another. Again, like, what is anybody going to do about this? In the words of Al Pacino to, uh, remember Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Sure. He goes to, you know what, here, this is going to have a couple of nibble pay moments, but I, this is probably one of the better scenes. Um, Language advisory. Yes, yes, yes. Here. He, this is where he talks to uh, Williamson. Here. America's most. He goes, what are you going to do about it? A ho. Company man. Listen, yeah, hold on, this is ad. I just wanted you to hear him say this. You stupid fucking cunt. Okay, that's a good line. Yeah, wait, listen, I'm talking to you, shit. <laughs> it just cost me $6,000. $6,000 and one Cadillac. You can hear it? That's right. Yeah. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it, asshole? Asshole. <laughs> it's like, what are you going to do? Shit. It's like the timing, you know? Where did you learn your trade, you stupid fucking cunt, you idiot? Whoa. Whoever oh. told you that you could work with men? Oh, I'm going to have your job, shit. Anyway. What are you going to do about it, a hole? <laughs> this is like my favorite thing. You should see the, and he, the way that uh, Kevin Spacey, unfortunately, he's a good actor, yeah. plays this startled, uh, like, deer in the headlights, you know, ne nepotism-laden guy. It's amazing. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Article. To win the war, we must break their spell. This is from the CanadianPatriot.org. Breaking the spell: Mind space, trance warfare, and neurolinguistic programming. By, I don't know what this guy is. Anyway, uh, David Gosselin. Although the science will be diligently studied, it will be rigidly confined to the governing class. The populace will not be allowed to know how its convictions were generated. When the techniques has been perfected, technique has been perfected. Every government that has been in charge of education. For a generation, will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of, need of armies of policemen. Bertrand Russell, the impact of si the impact of science on society. This article is for anyone who has found themselves frustrated as they try to speak with family members, friends, workers, strangers about the official COVID nineteen narrative and pandemic response. Going to find any kind of rational discussion nearly impossible. This article is for those who have raised concerns over totalitarian power grabbed by governments only to find a significant portion of people spellbound with their stories and identities reframed to fit the narrative. From collective sacrifices for the common good being rationalized in the form of Zoom calls among atomized individuals and families kept apart by lockdowns to, to the artfully vague and constantly shifting message around stopping the spread of a virus with a 99% survival rate, this article will demonstrate the attempts to reframe humanity using a new form of mass hypnosis. It will demonstrate how common sense thinking has come to be seen as morbidly eccentric due to the fact that a significant portion of the population has been reprogrammed by using a series of trans-inducing public messaging incantations, speaking of Egypt. Yeah. Above all, this article will seek to demonstrate how the spells cast over uh, how the spells cast over the last two years may be finally broken and incantations reversed. Despite the abundance of Hollywood spy thrillers and cartoonish depictions of Anglo-American intelligence agencies like MI6 and CIA protecting citizens, saving the world, or reigning in, in one of their own rogue elements, <laughs> speaking of rogue, the nature and extent of genuine intel agent psyops, uh, psychological operations are rarely explored. While conspiracy theories are bound, they may or may not be true. On the other hand, psyops and what former KG, KGB agent Yuri Bismanov called ideological subversion 
are very real yet seldom discussed in any meaningful manner. This is especially the case if we consider how the latest behavioral insights from the fields of social, social psychology and behavioral science have been used across the Western world over the last two years. Under the auspices of battling a virus with 99% survival rate, the population has been bombarded with an aggressive combination of neuro-linguistic programming, nudging, and public messaging incantations. As we will continue to demonstrate, all these techniques in one way or another have been designed to target what social engineers call uh, automatic motivations, i.e. our unconscious or pre-conscious minds. Um, here, okay. As we discussed in the previous article, many observe how a significant portion of the population appears to, to be under a spell. These spells have turned attempts to, at honest and rational discussion among friends, family, and coworkers into futile exercises. None of this is by chance. Public messaging and senior government officials have been using the latest insights into neurolinguistic programming, NLP, first laid out in a book called The Structure of Magic by John Grinder and Richard Bandler, and along with Nudge Theory, uh, oh, by that schmuck that, that was hired by WHO, Cass Sunstein, to actively change people's thoughts and behavior without their conscious knowledge or consent. As we will show, this new age of trans warfare and mass hypnosis has been spearheaded across the five eyes, starting in 2010 with the establishment of the Behavioral Insights Team by top echelons of the UK political elite. Um, okay, this guy talks about NLP, nudge theory, ta ta ta. This is just whatever. Um, yeah, there you go. In a 2008 paper authored by Cass Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule, the authors write the existence of both domestic and foreign conspiracy theories we suggest is no trivial matter, posing real risk to the government's anti-terrorism policies, whatever that the latter may be. Then they went on to list several steps government agencies could take to counter the growing threat of conspiracy theories. Government might ban conspiracy theorizing. Oh, God. Government might impose some kind of tax, financial, or otherwise on those who disseminate such theories. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is the Soviet Union, man. Government might itself engage in counter speech, marshalling arguments to discredit conspiracy theories. Government might formally hire credible private parties to engage in counter speech. By the way, this guy, Cass Sunstein, is taking from the book of uh, Saul Alinsky. Yeah. Government might engage in for informal communication with such parties, encouraging them to help. Um, yeah, thus Sunstein and his cohorts have been responsible for the framing of conspiracy theories as existential threats to democracy and counterterrorism, making very careful use of nudging and NLP practices to create powerful cognitive dissonances in the minds of anyone engaged in wrong think. Today, virtually all major public policy issues have an have in been reframed to nudge people into unconsciously making decisions that radically transform not only their lives, but the very makeup of, of society. Sunstein now serves in the Biden administration Department of Homeland Security. Okay, so he, now he wants to talk about, um, he's talked about nudging. Now he's gonna give you the, okay, the structure of magic. Taken together, NLP and nudging techniques may, may rightly be considered a new hybrid form of trans warfare. It may be compared with free previous errors of psychology um, warfare, but it's also uh, but also be seen as quite distinct in that the new degree of scientific precision has been achieved over the last decade. Uh, at this point, we should say that none of this is new, as Bertrand Russell himself observed, a descendant of one of the most of the oldest imperial lines of Britain's hereditary bloods, rule of thumb tricks and techniques of mass good, psychology good, have good, existed, good, existed good, for a while. Oh, Greg, Greg, yes. can you hear me? Go back, yeah. Like, go, yeah, back, yeah. go back like two or three sentences because you it broke up big time. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, I, I, can't, I can't hear it on the Zoom. But it's breaking. What, what did you hear? The, uh... Oh, it's that, you know, like when, when, you, when it breaks up, you sound all oh. like ro oh, okay. robotic. And the structure of magic taken together, NLP and nudging techniques may rightly be considered. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. A new hybrid form of trans warfare. It may be compared with previous eras of psychological warfare, but also be seen as quite distinct in that new degree of scientific precision, in that a new de degree of scientific precision has been achieved over the last decade. At this point, we should state that none of this is new. As Bertrand Russell himself observed, a descendant of one of the oldest imperial lines of Britain's hereditary blue bloods, rule of thumb tricks and techniques in mass psychology have existed for a while. Quote, I think the subject which will be of most importance politically is mass psychology. Mass psychology, scientifically speaking, not a very advanced study, and so far its professors have not, not been in universities. They have been advertisers, politicians, and above all, dictators. This study is immensely useful to practical men, whether they wish to become rich or acquire the government. It is, of course, as a science founded upon individual psychology, but hitherto it is employed 
it has employed rule of thumb methods, which were based on upon a kind of intu intuitive common sense. Its importance has been enormously increased by the growth of modern methods of propaganda. Of these most influential, the most influential is what called education. Religion plays a part, though the diminished one, diminishing one, the press, the cinema, the radio play an increasingly part. Bertrand Russell, The Impact of Science, 1951. Uh, okay. So uh, I just want to get to like the, okay. Opening the spell books. Um, one second. I want to get to the part where he talks about countering because we, we, we pretty much know, understand what's going on. One second. It's a long, it's a very long thing. Okay, breaking the spell. When considering the current future and future use of these kinds of techniques for behavior change, especially in regards to the climate crisis, let us remember the words of the early social engineering enthusiast and descendant, okay, blah, blah, blah. This is the same thing. Uh, the social psychologists of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that is snow that snow is black. Various results will soon be arrived at. First, that the influence of home is obstructive. Second, that not much can be done unless indoctrination begins before the age of 10. Third, that verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. You notice how the music is like repeated words. Yeah. You know, chicken noodle soup with a soda on the side. Chicken noodle soup, chicken noodle soup, chicken noodle soup with a soda. Like, just keep repeating, repeating, repeating. Right. Fourth, that the opinion that snow is white must be held to show a morbid taste for eccentricity. Like, what's, you know, you're a weirdo. But I anticipate it is for future scientists to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black and how much less it would cost to make them believe that it is dark gray. Um... I just want to get to the part where they talk about like, okay, this guy is like too long-winded of this stuff. Hold on one second. Okay. Oh, okay. Here we go. However, despite the seemingly sophisticated nature of this new age of trans warfare, the propaganda's methods rely on a very formulaic approach that be becomes hard to unsee. From the importance of time to losses loom larger than gains to social proof, i.e. 97% of scientists agree, our world is constantly being reframed, right? Rather than simply exposing the falsehood of one given body of information, we should identify the frames and consciously decide whether we are happy with or agree with the given choice of frame. We should ask others if they agree with the frames or ask them how they feel about the subtly different alternative frames, which may have vastly different implications. We should experiment ourselves to see how easy reframing the world actually is. Any average creative running college level student could easily come up, uh, become a top, tier social engineer with a basic how to reframing guide. When the new information appears before attempting to even assess it, we should ask ourselves what the frames are for the magic quote unquote lies in how incantations are framed rather than the information itself. Once named, the magic fades. In conclusion, contrary to the typical conspiracy theory where everyone is in on it, PSYOPs should be understood as the opposite of a Hollywood conspiracy thriller. Most people involved are not in on it because the operations are designed to appear organic affecting change almost magically, yeah. right? It's like how these guys uh, with the media and this, and so it's like, wow, you know? You broke up People again. People genuinely believe they're making their own decisions. Greg, Greg, you broke up like, again. What was, that, what was the last time you heard? You heard it was amazing. Somebody's like, zapping us, man. Yeah, like go back like uh, three sentences. In this, in conclusion, contrary to typical conspiracy theory, this? Uh-huh. Okay. Where everyone is in on it, PSYOPs should be understood as the opposite of a Hollywood conspiracy thriller. Most people involved are not in on it because the operations are designed to appear organic, affecting change almost magically. People genuinely believe they are making their own decisions, unaware of the mechanisms and environmental context models influencing how they unconsciously re respond to frames. Citizens should have the right to decide if they want to be nudged in a predetermined direction or further evaluate the frames and decide for themselves whether they may be a more nuanced reality and reasonable approach. Otherwise, imagine what future timelines we, uh, might we, we be in the event of a new crisis, perhaps a sudden systemic crisis in the financial system caused a by a sudden cyber attack. Yes, yeah, a lot of people talk about that. While the author wholeheartedly believes rational arguments, science, and the light of reason should and can prevail, part of that task necessarily implies identifying where and what the nature of the emotional and psychological blocks are, which prevent people from internalizing rational arguments. As we said, 
what we are witnessing with the application of these 21st century cutting edge insights from behavioral science and social psychology is trance warfare based on targeting automatic motivations. To win the war, we must break the spell. But I want to read, like, I skipped. There's one part where they talk about, like, uh, what these guys are doing. There's, like, a whole uh, series of things. Yes, yeah, so it's called East. I mean, I, I think I heard about this before. Um, East basically means in the early years, years, we often used the mind space framework, and indeed, some of the team uh, were centrally involved in developing it. We still use this framework, but we found in seminars that its nine elements were hard for busy policymakers to keep in mind. Uh, it's self reflecting cognitive chunking. At the same time, we found in our day to day trials and policy work that some of the most reliable effects came from changes that weren't easily capture, captured by mind space, or indeed, much of the academic literature. For example, we have often found that simplifying messages or removing even the tiniest amount of friction in a process can have a large impact. For these reasons, we wanted to develop a shorter, simple mnemonic, the EAST framework. Uh, EAST lays out four basic strategies for increasing population compliance from government policy. Make it easy, make it attractive, make it social, make it timely. The description of make it social found in executive summary on page five serves as a useful example of the overall approach and its power. Three, make it social. So show that most people perform the desired behavior. It's like every, everybody's doing it. Can you hear me? Right, right. Describing what most people do in a particular situation encourages others to do the same. Like just, you know, be normal. Similarly, policymakers should be aware of inadvertently reinforcing a problematic behavior by emphasizing its high prevalence. Use the power of you know, you know who tried to, there was a movie where he tried to do that mm -hmm. and it was right under our noses. Remember Billy Madison? Yes. Remember when uh when the kid his when he when he went back to like the first grade or the second grade, yeah. his friend he made a friend there Ernie the kid with the glasses yeah. he peed himself right yeah. and he was embarrassed he's like hey Ernie what's going on yeah. and then so that Ernie peed himself so he's like he came up with this idea he's gonna go put water on his pants yeah, yeah, yeah. then he peeled himself he goes, yeah. he goes look everybody Ernie peed himself and then he's like yeah. and then you know he's like then he's like, look Billy peed himself too he goes yeah I peed myself. People who pee themselves are the coolest, right? And then everybody like starts, you know, peeing themselves. Can, can I ask you a question? Yes, and I remember that moment. Can I ask you a question? How can a video on YouTube have 32,000 hits and 37,000 thumbs up? It can't. And that is the video that was released by Project Schmeritas today. Unless it's just a delay in the counter. What? They're not even trying to hide anything. I know. One second, I'm going to write. How can a video have more thumbs up than views? Do we have phantom viewers? Just sort of fascinating, like Bourla says about his little pill. dude. You broke up again. Say that again about Burla. you know. It, it's just it's, I said fascinating, like Bourla thinks about his little pill. Right. Yo, somebody's messing around with this. This dude, this. I'm serious. It's crazy, right? It's like we're getting straight jams. Get off, Ching Chang Chong. Go eat your freaking wontons, bitch. Sir, sir, we're being jammed. Jammed. Let me taste it. Raspberry. Only one man has the guts to give me. Raspberry. Lone Star. <laughs> Lone Star. Lone Star. See, they don't like our 80s stuff, but they like it when we read about NLP and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. Pieces of garbage. So that, that kind of stuff that you were talking about, that's very similar to... The way the uh, the ministering schmangels mm -hmm. operate in this world. It's, this is I'm not making stuff up. This is like what Bart Sado talks about this stuff all the time. Yeah. Like, yeah. like they they interact with the minds of people. They confuse them. They this is what they do. This is a technique of yeah. the ministering schmangels or those who are <clears throat> their lackeys. Yeah. You said so. Um, 
we're seeing it in action, basically. I'm not sure. It's 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 incredible. It's just pretty much incredible. We 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 I think we're literally seeing it. You know what I mean? Like we're also affected by it in some way. I haven't figured out yet how. You know, I, I don't feel like I have transcended the rest of mankind. You know. No. I feel, and maybe in a few small ways, you know, we're like, affected by it by fr the frustration that it causes in us, by you know, by way of like, yeah, it's just it's it's ag for by us it's agit prop. It's not a the psyop didn't work on us. It's the agitation. It's, it's the agitation of like, oh, like what the fl you know, you're going nuts. You feel like you're going crazy. So you know, you know what makes me crazy, and I mean it should, but. You know, like uh, when you click on something on Facebook, right? Yeah. So then, you know, like you click like on some kind of cause, right? So now you're going to get a billion of them in your in your feed, right? Yeah. Like, like I click one time on like, you know, like veterinarians w waging money, uh, not waging money, uh, trying to raise money for animals that were horribly abused and are trying to care for them and stuff like yeah. that. So, so then, you know, you click on that once and you contribute, then it begins to just shower hell on you. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. all of this hell that's going on in the world, it's true hell. And it's not meant for a single individual to be able to see that. Like, even if it was going on, let's say in the ancient world, right? There's a lot of messed up things going on, but you weren't exposed to every misery in the world. Right, you lived in a small town. You lived in a village. They didn't have, you know, the news, like all the time. Like every every now and then, someone would come with a message, you know. From most people would live in villages. They didn't. They didn't really know what was going on with the rest of the world. Yeah. Okay. They would have their horrible moments, but the rest of their life wasn't just completely drowned in agony, of like psychological agony, from all the pain of the world. Now that's what that that's what's happening to people. That's also a psyop. Yeah. I think. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like, we, 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 the individual was not built to be able to process the, the, the sheer amount of grief that exists in the world. You know what I mean? It, yeah, that's true. It's like, you know, you, you, you lived in your town, you knew a few people, you had enough emotional energy to help them and to be there for them and then you weren't just kind of uh bombarded with everybody's trials and tribulations yeah and they're real trials and tribulations you know what i mean yeah remember remember dave Chappelle was saying he was like uh he goes i'm not gonna smoke weed with black people anymore yeah. And then people people were like clapping around. He goes, he goes, relax, white people, you win by default. <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you got good weed conversation. <laughs> That's very funny. Yeah. He said, like, every time I smoke with a black dude, all I hear about is their trials and tribulations, right? He goes, yeah. it's a waste of weed. Right? Yeah. He goes, I was smoking with a with a with a white dude. He'd be like, uh, hey man, you know what I had last week? I had a cheeseburger, uh, french fries, uh Sunday. <laughs> Fanta, tobacco, yeah. onions, you yeah. know, like that's that's what that's what you're looking for, you know. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Listen, because they smoke to smoke their problems away, you know. Yeah, man, you gotta you gotta by the way, speaking of problems, they chased down uh Wolf Blitzer. Remember Wolf Blitzer from CNN? Wolf on the street. Yeah, yeah. Uh, about asking him about uh, the all the CNN scandals. Yeah, he ran ran away. Yeah. Who came up to him? Was it like just random people? No, it was guys from Project those dudes that chase people down from Project. Oh, the, yeah, the Project uh, Schmeritas. Yeah, Schmeritas. <laughs> Unbelievable! <laughs> it's just like the, I don't understand. It's it goes it goes back to the question you asked. These people actually think they're going to get away with all this crap. Well, I mean, they, well, they know they don't. They just know that they, they'll kill a lot before they do it, I think before they, they're caught. They just want to, they can't think about what's actually coming, yeah. okay? And it's like somebody who is, you know, got the drowning and they're yeah. 
you know, they're grasping at straw. Yeah, of course. Right. They'll do it. They'll, they'll grasp it, whatever, just to kind of delay it, you know, mitigate it, uh, just make anything easier or they'll smoke their troubles away. Yeah. All right. And, and then they, but the problem is that so far they've been getting away with it. Right. Yeah. So they, yeah. they don't necessarily have an awareness that there is eventually. Yeah, of course. Solution. They're so used to like having things go their way or whatever. They're just like, okay, whatever, you know, what do you do? Yeah. Anyway, sir. We're already up on uh, two hours, 40 minutes over here. You gotta be kidding me. Yeah. Quick, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, hopefully it felt that way for the people listening. <laughs> but yeah, it did feel kind of quick, you know? Mm-hmm. We you love it. Like, what? I said, we love the folks at home. We love you, America. America. We do. I do. Yeah, that's true. I think you do, too. Oh, so. You used to have entertainers, you know, like, like address America. Yeah. You know, like, we love you, America. You know, like. Well, today, it's, uh, I, po- I made a whole video about this Djokovic thing from kind of my perspective of, you know, a person who followed tennis. And I made, uh, I guess, tags, and a bunch of Croatians and Serbians commented. So that was good. And these guys are, you know, thanking me. Yeah, this guy wrote, Freedom, Brothers and Sisters, F the effing NWO, no pasaran, support from Croatia. Another guy, Milan Visković, yup. Uh... Another guy here, Marco something. That's the biggest difference between Noli and Rafa. Under such circumstances, Noli would always support him. And this ass picker is nothing but a selfish, oh, like that. Making, you know, like, you ever see Rafael Nadal play tennis? Um, actually, no. They, they call him ass picker because he has these shorts and he keeps like, <laughs> and they ride into it. They basically give him wedges every two seconds, literally. And he looks like he's just like picking his, you know, yeah, it's just funny to call him Aspic. Nothing but a selfish, scared piece of whatever. And then he said, "Respect, bro," to me. That's classy. Or so the Germans would have us believe. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> is that from Norm Macdonald? Yes, of course it is. <laughs> I what does he do that? It, this Hitler guy. What does he say? This Hitler guy. Something like. He goes. This guy's a real jerk. <laughs> Because the more I learn about this Hitler guy, the less I like him. Can I tell you something? Today I parked, I had a reunion with some friends and I parked and you know how they have the uh, meter parking, but it's on, it's like the zones, the numbered zones. My number was 102077. What are the last two, the last two numbers, what? I love it. I love it. Zero I would. Ser- I, I'm telling you, I'm searching for parking in Manhattan. I I went to eat on 48th Street, but I was, I was like, you know what? Let me park in the Third Hill area and take an Uber. So I park on 33rd, and it's just like 33rd. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I parked on 33rd and third and third. Oh my god! I parked on 33rd between second and third. Uh, and the, and it was one hundred two zero seven seven, but if you reverse, it's seven seventy two hundred one. I'm thirty third. My doctor told me I shouldn't work out until I'm in better shape. I told him, "All right, don't send me a bill until I pay you." <laughs> that's who. That's uh, the the even right. right. Yeah, brilliant. I'm writing. I'm writing brilliant. A book. brilliant. Yeah, I love that guy. I'm writing a book. So far, I have the pages numbered. <laughs> why doesn't Tarzan have a beard? Why, do, <laughs> why doesn't glue stick to the inside of a bottle? <laughs> that's, a great, that's so funny. Right? No, that's a good question. How come Tarzan, he doesn't have a razor, right? What, uh, experience is something you don't get until just after you need it. Yeah. Exactly. That's actually true. Yeah, that's just true, yeah. Why? why? Oh, yeah, here it is. Why is the alphabet in that order? Is it because of that song? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He says, you know, 
when you're sitting on a chair and you lean back, so you're just on two legs and you lean too far, so you almost fall over. But at the last second, you catch yourself. I feel like that all the time. <laughs> yeah, man. Pringles original intention. Here, you know what? Let me let me hold on. Hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna do this now. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this this uh tikkun for your critique of my accent. I wasn't, wasn't critique, I'm just trying to help you, brother. No, no, I know, I know. I'm saying so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna correct it. Actually, I knew it would drive you crazy, so it's funny. I think Pringles original intention was to make tennis balls. But on the day the rubber was supposed to show up, a truckload of potatoes came. Pringles is a laid back company. So they just said, F it, cut them up. How was that? <laughs> that was pretty good. Actually. Uh, here. Now we're going to do this one. Now we're going to do this one. An escalator can never break. It can only become stairs. You should, you should never see an escalator temporarily out of order sign. Just escalator, escalator temporarily stairs. Sorry for the convenience. And then there's a, and then the last one. Can I do one? Can I do one? Uh, I'll do. I'll do one more than you do. All right. I think you're gonna do mine. All right. Wearing a turtleneck is like being strangled by a really weak guy all day. Wearing a backpack and a turtleneck is like a weak midget trying to bring you down. All right, I'm done. I don't have a girlfriend. I just know a lady would be really mad if she heard me say that. <laughs> Here's one, for, here's, here's one for Stephen Wright. In my, house, in my house, there's this light switch that doesn't do anything. Every so often, I flick it on and off just to check. Yesterday, I got a call from a woman in Germany. She said, cut it out. That is hilarious. <laughs> oh, wait, hold on. For my birthday, I got a humidifier and a dehumidifier. I put them in the same room and let them fight it out. Nice, nice. Hold on, hold on. This guy responded to me on the, the Veritas because I asked, how can a video have more thumbs up than views? Fascinating. He goes, I imagine 90% of the viewers had to stop the video to throw up in fear and anger. Yeah. Mm. So it's like, oh, okay, if you didn't watch the video straight through, then it's, uh, I guess that makes sense. I don't know. 40,000 thumbs up, 35,000. I, I think it's just not catching up to the, Thumbs up, I, but I don't know. I think it's BS. The thumbs up also gets played around with all yeah, the time. Yeah, I, got, I got one that's kind of oddly connected to some of the things we talked about. Mm -hmm. Stephen Wright says, mm -hmm. I'm, addic I'm addicted to placebos. I could quit, but it wouldn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, quite, appropriate. Says, quite appropriate. Yeah. He, sa he says something interesting. He's like, the, the older you get, the more you learn to see what you've been taught to see. When you're mm -hmm. a kid, you see what's there. Yeah. yeah. It's incredible. Someone it's incredible. asked me, if I, were to if I were stranded on a desert island, what book would I bring? How to build a boat. <laughs> I, went, I, went, I went to a restaurant that serves breakfast at any time. So I ordered French toast during the Renaissance. <laughs> oh, there he is. Can you can you can you end with a, a, a appropriate one for for today, and then we'll end it. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll end with two. Okay, why isn't why isn't the number eleven pronounced one t one? One t one. Yeah, you know, like twenty one. Why not? One oh, t one t one. Okay. Yeah. And then, okay, so this one is interesting. Uh, hmm. Plan to be spontaneous tomorrow. That's funny. It sounds like why put off tomorrow where you can put off today, something like that, like procrastinating. Or so the Germans would have us believe. Yes. On that note, it's almost three hours. It's time to upload. Let's do it, man. All right. Next one is 39. So prepare 39. your 39 is big, man. You guys That's are gonna Mishkan, Shabbos, Malachas. And also, yeah. and also the name Elohim 
emerging mm. out of Yud Hey Vav. Oh yeah, and then after that is forty, which is Moshe Rabbeinu, and the desert, and all those kind of things. Is there many things, many many such things? Mm. Exciting. All right. All right. Talk soon. Yes, sir. Later.